and we'll move to Nick. Um, I think this summit enforced a lot of optimism that like our future's in pretty good hands. Like it was good to hear the different perspectives from everyone and because we all come from different places, there was lots of different optimism about different things. But I think it's pretty clear that the, our future's in good hands. Tahira. Um, what makes me optimistic is my friends and family and the community of people that I surround myself with that are all so positive and optimistic and, you know, have a good eye for the future. Ali, let's hear from you. So the thing that keeps me um, optimistic is that I have a belief that um, at the end of everything, there, like there's hope at the end of every trouble, there is hope. So like with hardness comes ease. So let's say, for example, like lockdown, most of us would be like in lockdown, but I still do believe that sooner or later we will come out of it. So this is the thing that keeps me going. Ella, away you go. Thanks. Something that I see as optimistic for me is I see a brighter future for me and for all the um, opportunities that I've made from people, from leaders that have allowed us to do and give us these amazing opportunities of going to school. And I can just see a brighter future. Over to Abby. Thank you. The thing that makes me optimistic is seeing what our generation can do for the future with all the opportunities that we've been given, like this youth summit, how we will use that for our future. Thank you, Abby. Over to Sav. Uh, what makes me optimistic is striving to help other people, not just myself, because what I want to do in my life is actually be a neurosurgeon or a psychologist. Wow. So striving to help people is what I want to do in my life. Good on you and good luck with that dream. And I think you heard Victor say earlier, optimism with purpose, right? Optimism with purpose. And that's what you have literally just said. And thanks for your contributions earlier, Sam. And Victoria, to you. <clears throat> I just think with the people that I'm around with, like my mentors and like my relatives, I think they just keep me going. Sometimes if I feel like a bit down, I think it's just great to have someone by your side. Nicholas, thanks. Uh, something that makes me optimistic is uh, nothing in life is locked in and everyone has equal opportunities to do what they want to do. And Hayley? I'm optimistic for the future because whilst things like right now they're not like the greatest and it's hard to be optimistic about them but eventually this will be over we'll all be off in like the real world and able to do whatever we want really. Let's hear from Diana. Yeah I think um, I just mentioned it in our group discussion that I'm optimistic about people and I'm optimistic about um, you know this generation that's coming after us. I feel like generations just keep becoming better and better and everyone's you know um each generation is becoming more kind and and more compassionate and even so yeah so people make me optimistic in the fact that we're becoming more kind and and compassionate with each other ella away you go what makes me optimistic i think it from trying my best and being around everyone inspires me a lot and they um and I learned so much from everyone, like my brother and my dad and mum and my teachers. Jack? Uh, yeah, what makes me optimistic is just seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, knowing that there's always a way out of this and also seeing today how many people are working towards a better future for everyone. Amelia, what makes you optimistic? I think my community makes me optimistic, uh, watching the passion that different members and corners of, you know, um, my school community, my, my town and my, my global community. Um, everyone's passionate about something different. Um, everything, you know, uh, different things give people reasons to wake up in the morning. And I just really love seeing that and finding those things for myself as well. All right. I want to say warm and jekka, everyone. I'm Marg Hepworth and I am speaking from Wurundjeri country. Um, I'm the executive officer of Init Initiatives of Change Australia and I am delighted to be your MC this morning. Warm and jekka, it means welcome. We come with purpose. And yes, we do. We come with purpose for the fourth Nelson Mandela Youth Leadership Summit. 
and it's brought to you by Future Voices and the Galawa organisation with their beautiful motto, Empowering Change. So I would like to begin this Youth Summit with a welcome to country and I invite Kiara Justin to share that with us now. So Kiara, can you unmute and welcome yeah, us? Sorry, all. I was having trouble with internet connection. <laughs> all good. All right. So, hi everyone, my name is Kiara Justin and I'm a 22 year old Indigenous woman from Shepparton. Um, my mob is Barapa, Barapa and Bangarang or Yorta Yorta. Um, so, my mob's from Barham, which is up New South Wales and Shepparton where I live right now. Um, I'd just like to start off by doing an acknowledgement of country. So, some of you may not know what that is. Um, so it's just a way to acknowledge and pay respect to the First Nation people as the traditional owners and ongoing custodians of the land. So I'm going to talk in Yorta Yorta Lake Wakaka to Yorta Yorta Bangrang Waka, which is welcome to Yorta Yorta Bangrang country. Um, and I just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're all gathered on today. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on Yorta Yorta and Bangarang country. I'd like to pay my respects to my elders, past, present and emerging. Um, I'd also like to extend that respect to any elders that are here in the summit today. And I'd also like to acknowledge the stolen generation as well. Oh. So yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Kara. Thank That's, you. No, thank you so much. And I like the you know, at the end there to acknowledge the stolen generations and many of, you know, whom are still with us, um, people yeah. my age, people my age were, yeah. were taken. So thank you so much for that. Um, I you. also, like Kiara, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of our land across this beautiful country and their connections to land, sea and community. And I pay my respects to their elders past present and emerging as we walk and work together for a better future. Yeah. Thanks, Thank Kiara. So Thank this year's theme is resilience, justice and youth development. It's aimed right at you guys with us today. Nelson Mandela was a world leader of high regard. His passion for social justice and equality continues to resonate around the world. And while I'm talking, I would love for you to write the qualities that you would like to see in all our world leaders in the chat. I wonder if you recognise that those qualities are there or they're things that we're hopeful for. Mandela believed that each and every one of us share these qualities and that it is through our choices in life that these qualities will rise within us. And he, more than anyone, understood resilience. He took action towards justice and believed wholeheartedly in equality of education for everyone. And Mandela told us education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Right? I want you to think deeply about that statement. So just looking... Um, at some of the qualities you guys are saying, we want to see our world leaders, I love this, with humility, thanks Trevor, empathy, absolutely, compassion, honesty, now optimism, excellent Victor, there you go, optimism from Abby, um, wow, accountability, lots of people saying respect, and Mandela was hugely recognised for his ability to, to respect everyone equally it didn't matter whether you were the king and queen of a country or whether you were you know the cleaner he offered the same respect to every single person and i believe every one of us can bring this integrity says susanna so this is this is really wonderful keep them rolling so today we have an amazing lineup of impressive speakers all of whom believe in resilience justice and youth development through education. So we're in for an exciting, informative and productive time. Now, why productive? Because we're actually challenging you today to take this learning into your homes, your schools and your workplaces. It doesn't just sit 
in this three hour space this morning. So this, my friends, is putting learning into mindful action. So I would like to welcome all our guest speakers as they, they will appear throughout the morning <laughs> and as well the Honourable Wendy Lovell um, MP, State Member for the Northern Victoria Region, Tina Powney, who's with us now. She's the Director and Executive Manager um, of the Galawa and Empowering Change. Dr Apollo and Dr Kenny Kahind um, and others who are board members of Future Voices and the Shepparton Nelson Mandela Learning Centre Project. And of course, Victor, who you all met, Victor Purton, is the Chief Officer of, Center for Opti of the Centre for Optimism. And Zoe Williams, the Regional Director of the Department of Home Affairs Federal Government. And I really do want to welcome Rashidi um, Sumali, Sumali, sorry, who is hugely responsible for bringing this Youth Summit together as he has every year. And before we begin, I wish to thank the following groups because they have offered tremendous support for this year's Nelson Mandela Youth Summit. And this is the Victorian Multicultural Commission, our Victorian State Government, Greater Shepparton City Council, the Centre for Optimism, Initiatives of Change Australia and the Gandhi Experiment, the Fairley Foundation, Greater Shepparton Foundation, Nelson Mandela Foundation in South Africa and the South African High Commission in Canberra and the Shepparton News. So for all the young people out there, Victor was asking you, you know, what makes you optimistic? You can hear in this lineup an enormous number of adults who are here also wanting a better future, right? This isn't just about the children are our future, we are all our future and we are all working together. So Mandela was passionate about changing society to make the world a better place. And here we are in an unprecedented time in history with the difficulties of COVID at our doorsteps and never more have we needed resilience as individuals and as a society. So people talk about us emerging to a better normal. And I just want you all to pause for one minute and think to yourself, if there was one thing I could change in this world, what would it be? What is it that you are personally passionate about changing? And I'd love for you to pop some ideas in the chat. Right? What are you personally passionate about changing? And, and summer has easier, more easier education. I agree with that, yeah. A more inclusive and accepting world and society. Thanks, Ali. Equal rights, Alex. Absolutely, equality for all, says Jack. Yes, more support for the LGBTQ plus community. Absolutely, that relates to equality right there. True equality, not just equality for some, equality for everyone. Our climate change, yes, Therese, of course, climate change. All right, developing young people to become active and leaders in our community. Now, that's exactly what this summit is all about. So please keep adding to that chat. We love to see these. We are going to hear from a series of speakers this morning. We will also be moving out to breakout rooms where you'll, you know, lots of discussion going on about what you're hearing from these speakers. And then we will return and we'll have time for you to be asking questions of our speakers and time for us all just to ponder about what we need to grapple with for a better society. So we hope to expand our thinking and open our hearts to positive change, right? Body, mind, spirit, all three combined in harmony, that's when positive change occurs.
So I would like to welcome our very first speaker, and this is Susanna Sheed. And Susanna is a state member of parliament for Shepparton District, Victoria. So Susanna, when you're ready, thank you. Huge welcome to you. Thank you for joining us and over to you. Thank you so much, Margaret. And welcome to everybody who is joining in today. This is a fantastic event and uh, one that Rashidi has been pursuing year after year. And I think it creates a real depth and understanding that um, you know, perhaps here in Shepparton we didn't have, but it's really going out to so many people in so many places. So um, I think we all need to note in the topic of the conference that resilience has probably been the most heard word over the last couple of years. And uh, um, the pandemic has really brought that about because if ever we needed re resilience, I think people have, um, recognise that that is a quality that is, is greatly in need. And of course, people have shown it in such huge amounts um, as we struggle through what has been an incredibly difficult time across the world and um, here in Australia, and perhaps more so in Australia right now, as we face our own challenges with COVID-19. Um, I'm asked to talk about making a difference in that regional sense. And I think um, for all people, who are aspiring to leadership, who think about leadership, who want to change something, who have maybe one goal or many goals in relation to change, um, I want to tell you that it's possible to do it and that you should be absolutely optimistic about it. And to do that, I'll just share shortly a little bit of my journey. I, um, I grew up in regional New South Wales on a farm. I eventually, um, I studied law and did a master's of law and eventually settled in Shepparton where I've been for, you know, over 35 years and close to 40. So um, this is my home and the, the bigger region has always been my home. The, um, the, the thing that, that has perhaps always influenced my life was the fact that my parents were very involved in their small community involved in organisations and, you know, helping people in the community um, and very much in, um, you know, things like the Country Women's Association and local agricultural leadership groups. So for me, it was always just a natural thing to do as I um, became an adult and lived in this community for many years to be a part of the community and to do my bit and to be involved in a whole range of things. So, um, I mean, just, and, and the, probably the most recent example of that before I went into politics was um, chairing the Fairly Leadership Foundation, um, not the, the, uh, the, the Golden Valley Community Leadership Program um, that the, the Fairly Leadership Foundation had established um, in the 1990s. And that's been an incredible organisation that has built leadership and capacity across our region for so long and is really widely supported by so many um, in our community and more broadly through philanthropy. So, so it really is important to have, um, to have people outside your community who support you and help you and, and the growth of that organisation has had, an, had amazing impacts on our community. So my story was I was a lawyer here in Shepparton for many, many years practicing generally and being involved in a range of community organizations and I guess areas of interest to me that included environmental water policy, um, organizations governing water issues and so forth. So, um, so in, two, in October, 2014, it, it became very clear to me that we, um, were a very safe seat in political terms. We'd had the National Party in power for um, over, um, well, they had represented this community for over 47 years. And there was a sense in which, um, in my view, parties often feel they own a seat. And it was, it was very much a case of a whole lot of things that Shepparton needed that we weren't getting. And the community was very loud about that. We needed better rail services. We needed... <clears throat> the redevelopment of the hospital. We needed better educational outcomes for our kids because they were clearly below the state average and there was nothing being done to, um, to really 
achieve a big change and a big investment. So they're, they're some of the things that, that were really concerning to the community. So I stood as an independent because I regard the party, um, my community as being my party and that is who you listen to. And it was very clear and very loud at that time that these were the things that were major issues in our, in our community. So um, I stood for election on a 29 day campaign with really strong community support. And um, I won that election and then I subsequently uh, won the following election with an increased majority. So I've had the great privilege of representing this Shepherd and District in the State Parliament of Victoria now for seven years. And of course, there's another election at the end of next year because here in Victoria, we have fixed four year terms. We don't ever wonder when the next election will be as they do at a federal level. So I think um, being part of your community is a really important component of who you are and what you do. And that's, um, that to me, um, I think was part of my success when I stood to get elected. You, people need to vote for you. And that, um, that uh, depth of involvement in the community and many years of being in a community obviously gives you, um, gives people confidence in you. So it's one of the things that I think is important when you think about making a difference. You you do need to be involved, and that starts from a very young age, being involved in organisations, community organisations, whatever it might be that th that is your area of interest, and that was certainly a component of the whole of the whole of my life before I went into politics. Perhaps most importantly um, for me, education has been the biggest issue because I come from a regional area and I grew up on a farm and it was distant from anywhere and educational opportunities were more difficult. I started out doing um, what we called correspondence, which is really just homeschooling for my first couple of years because uh, we were on a farm where there was no school within any distance that was accessible. But after moving closer to a town, I started attending school in, region, in a regional community. But the, the reality is that um, regional communities have always been underdone when it comes to education. And you just have to read any Auditor General's report or any of the studies that have been done on it. And it, uh, it is often simply because we don't get heard the way we should get heard and we don't get the investment in education. And there's a whole range of things around our community that, that will lead people not necessarily wanting to come and be in a regional area. So to be a successful regional area, you need to be able to attract and recruit people at every level. You need doctors, you need teachers, you need agricultural scientists, all these, all these things, university lecturers. You, you can think of any number of people who you need in your community. And for people to come to a community, they, they wanna know that their kids can get a good education. They wanna know that they can get decent medical assistance when they need it. And they want accessibility. And um, in a way, th those were three very challenging things for this region. And we've, we've now seen almost a billion dollars worth of investment in, in the hospital in rail that's underway at the moment. Um, a massive investment in the development of the new senior secondary, the, the new secondary college, Greater Shepherd and Secondary College that'll open next year. And of course, the Marupna um, Early Children Centre. So these things are really important when it comes to attracting people to come to your region to do the work that needs to be done. But it's also really important to develop within your own community um, the people who will get educated and give them the opportunities and they will then also become leaders in our community. And we've seen that uh, with La Trobe University and the courses that they offer. So making a difference, um, making a difference to me is very practical. Um, I think it, it is about actually getting up and doing something. And, uh, and when I ran that first campaign, it was called Stand Up Shepherd and It's Our Turn. And that was uh, that really resonated for me very strongly. What we needed at that time. There's so many big issues now around um, around the world, and I think we are all very focused much more now um, beyond our own community um, across Australia and indeed across the world, and especially 
here in Shepparton, I, th I think we, our awareness of what is happening in other parts of the world is so great because we have such a multicultural community. And uh, I think our heart goes out to everyone in our community with their connections uh, with Afghanistan at the moment. It's truly been an horrific time for people to see what has happened in that country and to know that here in Shepparton we have many people, many families who have family back there who are, are feeling that awful pain and I certainly empathise with them. Um, all our, our Afghani community. But it's not, um, it's not limited to that. We see so many people who come here as refugees from countries where they are, um, they're, they're effectively unable to go back for political or other reasons that um, would put them at risk if they did. So we have a community that's quite different for a regional community um, in that it is such a multicultural community and we've always worked hard to celebrate that and we talk about that a lot but it is really important that we do things about it as well and we have all sorts of events and we have food festivals and we we do many things to um, try and you know integrate in, in among each community and get to know each other better but uh, dare I say that the most important thing you can do is invite a family another family to your family and have a meal together. I think fundamentally that is what brings people together. That's what brings understanding. And um, it's something I think we need to do more in Shepparton actually. Um, it's, um, we, we've had uh, Fiona Smolinars here in Shepparton doing a lot of work in relation to recruitment and helping people settle in. And just recently, um, a young woman who's now working at Headspace moved in next door to me. And because of COVID, I haven't been able to have it to dinner yet, but we keep um, passing herbs over the fence to each other and hope that one day we'll share a meal together because these are things that, that are really fundamental. They're personal, but they make such a difference to the bigger picture and to how we operate as a community. So that's something I would urge you, you all to think about. I know that um, on... When it comes to the big picture, um, we look at the world, we look at what's happened in the United States over the last 12 months, the, the incredible threats to democracy that are in existence. And I think it's really important that we, um, that we look closely at those sorts of issues because they are, they are really fundamental to the nature of how we all operate in our country. And, we see many failed states around the world. We saw the challenge. We saw the, you know, the the attempt to take over the Capitol building in Washington in January. Um, we've seen many things that are really quite frightening. We have more repressive regimes in the world than ever before. We live in one of the luckiest countries in the world, and it is our job to make sure that we stay that way, that we share it, and that we take a leadership role. Um, Margaret, how much longer do I have? I think we will wind you up in, in like in one I, minute. Like, I had a sense of moving around. Yep. Please, spin, you know, please wind up. Yeah, okay. So look, just one more thing I'd yes, like to say. The, yeah. the most fundamental challenge uh, that we all have is climate change. Mm -hmm. And the latest IPCC report you know, indicated that it left no doubt. Um, we can't be apologists for, for, what, for what is happening. Um, young people and old people and every, everyone in between really, but I see strong leadership among many of the older people in the world and I see it among young people and together we have to find a way to overcome and to bring back into control the warming of the planet because it is absolutely the most critical issue that we have now and we have to hold governments accountable. We have to be personally active. We have to be active within our organisations and we really have to do everything we can. So I see a lot of reason to be optimistic. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, we've been through a really tough 18 months, but there's a sense in which with the fact that we've got a vaccine, we got one and we got many as it turns out and it's available and it's free. And I think we can all see a light at the end of the tunnel to some degree in terms of COVID, but we'll always be faced with big issues. And it's those of us, those of you who are here today because you're taking an interest in this topic 
who can change the world, whether it's local, whether it's bigger, or whether it's huge. So best of luck to all of you. Oh, Susanna, thank you. Thank you. That is a really, really wonderful opening for our um, Youth Summit this morning. Um, look, it's not often we, we all get a chance to, to just meet a state MP in this manner and, and have this kind of conversational um, you know, experience. So thank you. We're going to go into breakout rooms, Susanna, and um, we're going to invite people to chat about what, you know, the points you have just raised and you've raised many. So in your breakout room, I want you to think what were some of the key things Susanna was raising? And she certainly, um, she said, making a difference is very practical. And in her own story, you can see in here how many different action points she took to make change and particularly for Shepparton um, and, and a lot around education. So seeing education is vitally important. But what I want you to think about is sometimes we get so overwhelmed with these big issues like climate change or the oppression you were referring to you know, across the world, Susanna. And what I really admire about this is when you chunk big problems, you chunk them down to bite sized like this. And this is talking about working effectively in your region actually has a ripple effect across the country and that has a ripple effect across the world. So I want to thank you for what you've done in Shep. My father was born just out of Shepparton in a little town called Zerust. <laughs> so we're going to go into breakout rooms. Now you'll find yourselves in with a mixture of people. Um, you need to rapidly start chatting away. You've probably only got about five minutes and one of you needs to sort of take on that role of, you know, welcoming everybody and getting everybody um, started talking. Yeah, welcome back, everybody. We we had a wonderful discussion. Um, now, is Susanna is Susanna still with us? She I am. am. You are. Yes. I, I can't see you there, but great. Are we able to bring? Ah, there you go. Thank you, Victor. Susanna, we had a huge discussion about things that you raised. So you obviously inspired people. I'm going to invite. Have we got um, Tahira, Tahira Lavara? And do yes. you have a question for you, Susanna? Um, so my question for you is how hard has it been being an MP in Shepparton during our COVID lockdowns? And what have you had, um, what has it meant for you have having to do? So what have you had to do? Um, look, I have to say it's probably been, it's been an incredibly busy time and it's been, such a strange time because it's all happening in my house to some degree. You know, the, the thing that's really strange about COVID is that we're so locked in. I mean, I've just come back from Parliament last night. So um, I'm glad that Parliament's able to function again and we'll be going to Parliament a lot for the rest of the year. And that's a great opportunity to talk about your community. But I think when um, I'm, I'm thinking of just the last three weeks, really, and the and three or four weeks, you know, since day one when we had that outbreak, the first case, and then we were 17 by the end of the day, and then, of course, half the city was shut down, and and the challenges that that presented, um, I think in Shepherd and everyone played a part, and um, my part as a state representative is to make sure that I can access. Uh, resources from the state government to um, help deal with the issues we were having and uh, there were people working on the ground but bearing in mind that half the volunteers were locked down half you know so many of the people who would normally be um, leaders and organizers and volunteers they were out of action including people who ran the check the checkouts at the supermarket and so the challenges were huge and and really it what I observed was all those who were left came in. Um, they 
organised, they did whatever they could to help the community. And at a state level, it was my job to get the emergency assistance we needed. Um, the army came in, the emergency management Victoria came in and put a person in to help with organisation, um, organising some more food relief from Melbourne. And, um, but on the ground, it was just very much this community um, doing for the rest of the community. And I have to say, I think Shepparton's really stood out as an example and, and they've been widely praised Shepparton for the way they did it. And even the prime minister beamed in on Monday morning to congratulate you know, community, the community more generally for, for what they'd been able to do, which was really lovely. Wow, to, to him, did you have one more question? Um, yeah, so I'm interested in politics. If I were wanting to become a state MP, what should I do to start heading towards that path? Um, so, um, look, people go about getting into politics in many ways, but I've never wanted to join a political party. I've never been a part of a political party. One way, of course, is to join a political party and work hard and be active and, and involved. And many people who um, become politicians have come up through the ranks of the parties. So that's one way. Um, the other, and I think this probably reflects rural communities a bit more, is, is being well known and involved in your community, being a leader in your community. So, I mean, I would say take all the leadership opportunities that are ever offered to you because you learn so much. I mean, I have never been to a conference where I didn't come away knowing that I'd learnt something, even if I thought overall it was awful. And I've been to a few awful ones, but, but generally speaking, you will always learn something. So, you know, we've, we've got our local leadership program. There's the um, Leadership Victoria, the statewide one. These things are really great for growing your perspective of the state and the country. And, and even, and even the world. And so take those opportunities, be involved. And, and, and that means, um, you know, it's not just a, hey, look at me, I'm a leader. It's actually being in there and doing stuff, you know, being, um, being the secretary, being the treasurer, um, fronting up and handing out parcels if things get tough, you know, it's, it's all of that stuff. So that will, that gives you the credibility in your community and also you learn so much from it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tahira. Thank you for your questions. And I know in the breakout rooms, our breakout room discussion was wonderful about political oppression, about fear of diversity, and then discovering diversity was magnificent. Um, talking about Australia and we're all locked down and yet we are one of the most democratic uh, countries in the world and still have this freedom even in lockdown. So thanks to you both. Um, Ali's put a question in the chat and I don't want you to answer this, Susanna, because we're going to keep moving. But I think it's a great question for all of us to consider. How do we know when to take the initiative and that first move? And what do we do when we don't get any support or help when we need it? And how can we remain as dedicated and committed to the cause that we'll be aiming to achieve? I want everybody to, that's not just for our, our politicians to consider, that's Nelson Mandela would say, right there, Ali, you have raised something each and every one of us needs to consider. So well done. Susanna, thank you so much. Thank Can you. we all put our virtual clapping hands up there for Susanna? And we will <laughs> and we will keep <laughs> moving. And all the best for Shepparton yeah. and the wonderful work that you're doing, Susanna. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye everyone. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. So we are going to move now. Uh, we're going to be listening to Tina Powney. And Tina, as you heard earlier, is the director and executive manager um, of the Galawa. Yes. <laughs> and they are empowering change in people's lives. And Tina will share her story and talk about some of the great leadership lessons that we all need. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah. Tina. Thank you so much, Margaret. 
Um, welcome to the Youth Summit. Um, I'd like to start by um, giving my respects to elders past and present and reflecting on my youth. So I'm just going to go through a bit of a story with you, um, very holistic brief story. My story started back when I was one. I grew up in outer home care and I learnt to fend for myself. Not having a sense of family, of belonging, being part of a community or a mob, it's a significant part of many young people's own story. Wanting to belong, to be somebody, to matter, to be loved and okay for who you are as you're part of your emotional DNA. When this is ripped from, a young, from young people through abuse, homelessness, illness, disability, violence, it places a young person in a vulnerable, vulnerable place, a hurting place and a lost place. There is, of course, so much more to my story and I might get to write about it one day. I can say through my own child of being me being hurt, I can take you through the healing of my words and I can say that I matter. I can then look at young people through the eyes of my own experiences and extend and, and continue the rage within. I can look in other young people and live, who live the life of vulnerability in the eyes and say that I'm able to walk with you. Encourage you today is a fresh day. Family does matter. And the other part of my story, I'm a mum. I have a son who is 21 years of age who lives with a disability, who has crossed the paths with the justice system and is vulnerable. His journey taught me to dodge back to, back to my own vulnerability and show respect for not only his needs, but the needs for our youth, trying to find their way in a world that has been incredibly unkind to many of them. In so many ways, when trouble visited our family one night, we were con con confronted with reality that young people at risk need to be reconnected with their community. They need a safe place to be themselves and discover their next step into adulthood. I'd like to finish with my personal journey about dealing with trouble. Instead of holding on to the injust of my son's situation, remaining angry, I decided to look at his needs and so many Aboriginal children, young people and adults living with a disability. I started Gullawa. When I sat at my table at home with my family, and our son was missing, and he was currently serving a sentence with a disability, I would wait for phone calls. Learning how to navigate the justice system, I could just, he just couldn't call, and um, we just had to wait. We began the life, when our phones rang, we'd all run to see who was calling. He would get a few minutes to tell us he was okay, and then it would end. I would live like this in my home for months. Well, it's been the last three years. Our whole lives have changed. We've carried our phones with us and our lives were living, holding our mobile phones until he would call. I've decided that I wanted to make change and put what's happening to us into empowering change. Gullah is a therapeutic service for community, making change for all communities, supporting participants with a disability, mental health, homelessness, or in the justice system. Gullawa Mob has no wrong door. We support and care for everybody with a disability, the whole family. We attend court. We make sure participants, participants have support, be heard, able to navigate the legal system and understand their court outcomes. It's a journey with the whole family to understand justice and the release. If the participant is sentenced into the prison system, Gullawa Mob keep the connection. We visit, we have Zoom meetings, making sure our participants' needs are met. Then on release, we support our participants into housing, teaching them life skills, cooking, cleaning, and maybe just taking them down the street to the supermarket to buy groceries and make a meal. We have participants right across Victoria and part of New South Wales. We have grown in the last 10 months. We have over 30 staff from therapists, social workers, support coordinators, support workers and nurses. We have been able to support so many participants and empower change. 
In the future, we hope to have housing for youth with disabilities, prisoners who need support on release, and a healing centre for our community to come together, who have complex upbringing and would challenge any of us to survive or do something about it. Finally, my experiences taught me the need for connection. Being heard and understood, understood begins to restore hope for a better future. Young people are our future. This summit is an opportunity for us to listen to each other, to hear the voice of our own hurting child within, find a creative way to turn our pain into healing, to allow healing to make a difference for ourselves and our family, our community and the world we live in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tina. Um, look, your story is incredibly powerful. Um, this is a story of um, yourself and people around you who, who could have made a different choice, right? And you took an incredibly difficult and painful and unjust situation. And now you have you know, really moved into action in a very powerful and supportive way. Um, Shane has put in the chat there, it's our role to include people to help avoid the disconnect, right? That's huge. And, and it's not just the disconnect, um, there's a disconnect between people, there's a dis disconnect with nature as well. And we need all of those things to now come together. Um, and he says, you know, that it's taught in schools, they take a very take connectedness very seriously as it's a positive behaviour. And that's exactly what the Galawa um, group are doing, right? Thank you so much. You talk about vulnerability. This is important for us all to think about. Remember I said earlier, it is body, mind, spirit. It's not just our minds, Right? Some of the greatest minds in the world have created some of the most dangerous things in the world. So we need to have our hearts open as well. And we need to come from our gut as well, right? To come up with solutions that are beneficial, not, not negative. Um, talk about justice in a way that's just so real and so... Um, you know, you are so connected to this. So what I would like everybody to do now, I just want you to, we're not going to go into breakout rooms. We're just going to stop for a minute, right? I'm going to, you can turn your um, screen off if you want for a minute. And I want you to deeply reflect. You can shut your eyes. I just want you to think about what Tina has shared. And then I want you to think of some questions you might like to ask Tina. So, Victor, in one minute, we're going to come back with people asking questions or comments, right, comments for Tina. She's opened her heart to us now. So let's all be quiet for one minute. So I think we'll come back to you, Tina. Um, and if we have, we've got lots of people saying thank you very much in the chat. Um, Sav is saying it's, it, it's really true. It's positive behaviour to be able to connect with your school and community and what a difference that makes for people, right? So I'm wondering if you have a question or a comment for Tina, um, can you put your virtual hand up and then we'll see you in the lineup. So is anyone there would like to ask Tina a question or make a comment? There you go. Victoria, thank you. Would you like to unmute? <clears throat> yeah. Um, I've got a question. How did you change your mindset from like being hurt and now like wanting to start your own business and company? Like how did that like change your mindset? 
Thank you, Victoria, for the great question. Um, I was actually sitting at my table when my son was in custody and and um, this is before COVID started and I went down to Melbourne and I was speaking to some other community members waiting to go in to see their son in custody. And everybody told me the same story. Their loved one had a disability or had um, been in an accident and had a disability and they were sitting in the justice system and they just couldn't navigate it. Um, and, you know, my son has autism and, um, you know, mental health issues and he was only 18 and, you know, even for him to fill out a form when he was transferred to a new prison, he couldn't do that. So um, I just went home one day and um, quit my full-time job and just sat at my table and told my family my, what my dream was. And uh, it started from there. I started off with three staff. I think we have 35 today. So, um, wow. yeah, and it's just amazing the work we've done. And, yeah, so we all walk together as staff and we all have an input on how Galloway is driven. So it's a whole different model. So that's how it all started, Victoria. It was something very close to my heart and I wanted to empower change. Yeah. yeah. Uh, to, um, that is a great question, Victoria. It really is. It's absolutely key. You know, to we have choices for everything, for all our behaviours. And, um, and even when we are hurt, I think that's a wonderful question. How did you change your mindset? So yeah. what Tina's really showing us is incredible leadership because she could have made many other choices. So, yeah, thank you. Does anyone else have a question or just a comment um, for Tina? Here we go. Bridget, thank you. Hi, Tina. Um, I just wanted to know, how do you like keep going when things are getting really hard or, you know, when something goes bad with your son or, you know, like we all have those moments where things just not going how we plan or, you know, what, whatever that may be. How do you keep going and how do you keep pushing through that? I always think about the higher power. I always go, we all got a direction. We just got to hold on for the ride. So my son was sentenced yesterday. So he's been in the system a very long time. Um, and last week he was refused a corrections order because he wore shorts and not pants to the corrections meeting on Zoom because he's got sensory issues. So we, we adjourned it and I just said, it is what it is. And he'll be home in 14 days. So mm -hmm. it's, um, yeah, it's, I think it's about getting up in the morning and staying for the day, not thinking about what happened behind you in the revision mirror. I think it's about looking in the wind, windshield having a GPS, have a direction. There's going to be bumpy roads. There's going to be smooth roads. But I think hanging on for the ride and just being kind and just go, it's live for today. Today's Friday. I'm living for Friday. Yeah, thank you. That's my okay. Good, my goodness. Um, look, these are great questions. This is exactly what we need. And that that is a powerful, powerful answer. Um, April, I think you have something to say. Hi, Tina. Um, I just wonder what the word Galawa actually means and what it means to you more importantly. So Galawa, my, my husband's a Barapa Barapa Yorta Yorta man and his grandfather's last name is Galawa and we put AH as Aboriginal health on the end of it. Right. So we, right. we focus a lot on the Aboriginal community, but we focus on everybody. It doesn't yep. matter. You know, um, the cold community... Um, I don't want another mum to sit at the table like I did with my with my heart broken. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that's what I wanted to empower change, that we all walk together. We're all Australia. Yeah. 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 Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, April. Oh, thank <laughs> Good question. Um, yeah, that inclusiveness, Tina, we all yeah. walk together. Yeah. Right? We all walk together. Now, Sav, Sav wants to say something to you. Sav? Okay. Um, hi Tina, I just want to say a huge thank you for sharing your story and that's a really admiring story to just keep going when things are tough and showing that your beliefs and your admire to help your son and to just show the world who you are and I think it's a really special thing to do. So thank you. Thank you, Sav. Thank you so much. Sav, that's gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, and, you know, just to speak up like that. And we, 
we love your posters behind you. They actually say a lot too. Um, yeah. Tino, yeah, I just want to say a deeply special thanks because you are you're sharing something deeply personal, and boy, we can learn you know so much through people um, going to that vulnerable place, right, yeah. and then sharing that it's extraordinary what you are doing in your team. And uh, Tino's told us a little bit about how they work. Um, it's this very, you know, uh, equitable workplace, isn't it? Yeah. Where everybody is part of the solution. So yeah. extraordinary yeah. work. Thank you. Can everybody please, you know, put your virtual um, hands <laughs> up thank you. for Tina. And we want to say thank you to the Galawa um, organisation because they are one of the key supporters of this Nelson Mandela Youth Summit um, this year. Thanks, Tina. And thank you. we will be in touch. I want to get to know you so much better. <laughs> thank thank you. you. We are absolutely honoured and privileged to have um, Kathleen Lively with us who is the US Consul General um, in Melbourne. Um, and Kathleen will be speaking to us about, do you want to be a diplomat? And what are the challenges and opportunities of taking such a life journey? So thank you so much for being with us and we welcome you warmly. Thank you so much for having me. I'm sorry I missed uh, Tina's presentation earlier. It sounded uh, fantastic. Um, so so uh, I really appreciate this kind invitation. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge the Yada Yada and Bangarang people, as well as the Bun Wurang people, the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather today. And I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. And I extend respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that are here today. I'd also like to acknowledge the hardship that uh, Shepparton and Melbourne communities are facing during this current lockdown. I know we all look forward to a time when we can be together in person again soon. Uh, and it would be really nice to be with you, uh, not virtually, but in person. I was asked to speak about diplomacy and uh, the path to becoming a diplomat and the challenges and opportunities that exist in this field. And it's, a fitting, it's fitting for this topic to be associated with, with Nelson Mandela. I don't know if you've heard any Nelson Mandela quotes yet today, but you'll hear a bunch from me, and I'm sure there's other people that will probably share some as well. Um, what an inspiring leader and statesman he was, and his commitment to public service and his country was really unsurpassed. So I thought I'd cover three main areas and try to leave some time for questions. I'll discuss a bit about my background and how I became a diplomat and talk a little bit about what diplomacy and diplomats are. And then lastly, sort of the challenges and opportunities in that field for you. So how did I get here? Um, Nelson Mandela has a quote about education that's one of my favorites and I'm gonna read it, so bear with me. Education, he said, is the great engine of personal development. It's through education that the daughter of a peasant can become a doctor, the son of a mine worker can become head of the mine, the child of farm workers can become president of a great nation. It's what we make out of what we have and not what we are given that separates one person from another. That's certainly true for myself. I was born and raised in Washington, DC, and my parents are from the rural Southern United States, uh, from a, a poorer region. Their economic situation did not allow them the opportunity to receive an education beyond what we call in the United States high school. So they were never able to go to uni or college or university of any kind. They made their way out of, from economic necessity from where they were from in the rural US to the United States, to uh, Washington DC, where post World War II, there was a big economic boom that happened that created many jobs in the United States government. Uh, they both ended up finding work and they found each other in DC as well uh, as clerks for different departments for working for the government and they worked their way up from there. They worked extremely hard to make sure that my brother and I would have the opportunity to go to university and, and for myself on to graduate school, both of which are very expensive in the United States. So they had to save a lot of money um, in order to do that. 
they instilled in us a sense of public service and giving back to those in need. I, I always remember that there was always somebody extra at our dining room table at, at night, uh, no matter what. Um, my parents were always reaching out to extended family members with a helping hand or to those in our community that needed some extra support. Uh, all while my father worked extra jobs, so he worked his day job for the government, and at night he sold shoes in a department store, and on the weekends he worked keeping the books for a hotel. And my mom, she worked full time as well, and then also found time to raise my brother and I. So really hard working folks trying to make sure that their children had a better opportunity. Uh, their focus on community service and commitment to family, the importance of education, and the value of public service led me to work for the government as well and to after I finished my schooling. I started my public service career at uh, the United States National Institutes of Health, which is the United States' government's medical science research institution that finds cures for different human diseases. And I was lucky enough to work on some long-term studies about diabetes that were focused on a Native American tribe called the Navajo that live in Arizona, the state of Arizona. As you probably know, the U.S. indigenous population is a magnificent compilation of tribal groups with their own rich traditions. And, but they've had a real difficult history and are still working to achieve better opportunities for their people as they were often pushed out of their traditional homelands by the Europeans that came uh, and settled in the United States in the 1600s and 1700s. Um, I'm a, a descendant of, uh, a distant descendant of, of the Cherokee tribe in the US. So working with indigenous populations and championing greater access to opportunities for Native Americans is very important to me. Um, it's also important to the Biden administration. So our current US administration, they're focused on providing better opportunities for groups such as Native Americans in the United States and other groups that have been disadvantaged and marginalized. But so I started in the public health field. That was the path I started on. How did I end up here? Well, like most people, life has its own ideas about where I should end up. Um, when a personal relationship that I had led me to look for work overseas, I ended up starting a career in the United States Department of State. But first, as an information technology professional, something that I had limited experience with, but um, I found computers interested, and frankly, that was the only job that was available. So I took that job and made the most of it that I could. That path later led me to diplomacy. After working many years helping people with IT, I then started to do more management and moved in a different direction within the State Department. In fact, those two careers, IT and diplomacy, have a lot in common, even if it doesn't seem that way. Um, they both require patience and empathy, what we call relationship management, so managing relations with others, and keen problem-solving skills. And when they're done right, both IT and diplomacy, people and organizations thrive. So even though they seem very different, they're actually, you can apply broad skills across the spectrum. So why do I tell you about this meandering path to where I am today as the US Consul General in Melbourne? To encourage you that though you may think it's unlikely, you too can succeed in public service and diplomacy, or in, perhaps in fields you haven't even thought about. What lessons can you take from my story? First, work hard like my parents, and occasionally like me, although I think they work harder than I do. Sometimes it seems that you're not making progress, but I've found that hard work always pays off, particularly if you have the support of your parents or elders or other mentors in your community. Look for ways for the, that community to support you and your thoughts and your dreams. Second, be ready for detours that will inevitably occur along the way. Don't let that throw you as progress is rarely linear. I think I, was, I heard Tina talk about living in the moment. That's really important. Sometimes you can't dwell on what might have happened in the past. You have to live in the moment and look, look to the future. Um, so this leads to lesson number three. Be adaptable. See how you can take your current skill set and apply it broadly to other fields. Fight against that discouraging voice in your head that might say to you, as it said to me, hey, I was only trained in IT, so that's the only thing I can do. Look more broadly at what you are good at 
and see where else those skills will be useful. And lastly, be open for all opportunities. Just because you haven't done something before does not mean you should be afraid to try something new. One of my favorite Nelson Mandela quotes is, do not judge me by my successes, judge me by how many times I fell down and got back up again. So if you fall down, you can get up and keep, keep going. So what exactly is diplomacy? It's a good question. From the dictionary basically says that it's the practice of conducting negotiations between nations, the ability to handle relationships without causing hostility. It's the method of influencing decisions and behavior of foreign governments and their people through dialogue, negotiation, and other methods that don't include violence. In short, it's a way for countries to negotiate with each other. Usually, uh, each group in a negotiation asks for more than what they expect to get, and then they compromise. It's kind of like compromising with your parents when you want something. You might ask for a little bit more, but in the end, you'll, you'll end up in the middle. Um, successful negotiation results in what we call a diplomatic agreement, and the most formal kind of an agreement is a treaty, which is a contract, a written contract between, between, between countries. Sometimes negotiations are over points of conflict, such as border disputes. Um, one example I can think of that you might have read about is between India and China in the, in the Himalayas. They're fighting over where their one border ends and the other border begins. Um, but diplomacy can also be negotiations between countries who are banding together to solve common global problems, such as climate change. There's something called the COP26. COP stands for Conference of the Parties, and it's a summit on combating climate change. It's being held in Glasgow, Scotland this coming November. This summit is organized by the United Nations, which is a group of nations around the world trying to work together to solve problems. It's been held every year for the past three decades, but as the world starts to pay more attention to climate change, this particular summit will be really important. Many countries will come together and try to reach an agreement on how to combat global climate change before the damage to the earth becomes too great for us to, to fix. So in diplomacy, this negotiation between countries, whether the issues are climate or human rights or empowering marginalized communities, border disputes, technology issues like cyber hacking, trade disputes, or many other issues, they have a great deal of impact on the people of every country. So we need to, to work at it and get it right, which is why we need people like you who are interested in, in making things better to be involved because diplomacy has a, has a great impact on everyone's lives. Uh, at its heart, diplomacy is the art of conflict resolution and conflict prevention in order to promote peace and prosperity for everyone. It's pretty important. Uh, Nelson Mandela also said about diplomacy, if you wanna make peace with your enemy, you have to work with your enemy and then he becomes your partner. So diplomacy is working to find and nurture more partners because as he also said, all conflicts, no matter how intractable, are capable of peaceful resolution. So as long as you can develop and have willing partners, we can solve any problem together. People who practice diplomacy are called diplomats. Diplomats like me try to help their country and the world by encouraging cooperation between nations, by building partnerships and maintaining peace to increase prosperity. So what kind of challenges are there in diplomacy? Some that come to mind are uh, violent non-state actors. So these are other groups, you've heard of them probably like ISIS or other terrorist groups that are not acting as a nation, but act instead to support some ideology that's not inclusive and not tolerant. It's very difficult to have diplomacy with those groups, to negotiate with them if they really have no interest in compromise. Other challenges to diplomacy is that it's very complex. Many of these issues aren't simple. Climate change, for example, uh, nations that, are, that may have be better off, may have better technology and are in a better place economically, might have an easier time working on climate change goals 
as opposed to poorer countries that are rely, rely on older technology in order to power their factories or their vehicles, and they don't really have a choice. So sometimes it's not so simple to do the right thing. It may seem like everybody knows what the right thing is to do, but it's harder for some people and some countries than it is for others. Also, just plain old bureaucracy is a challenge. Um, diplomatic process can sometimes be very formal and legalistic. And that means that some negotiations can take a really long time. I don't know if you've ever heard of something called the SALT talks, but that had to do with trying to reduce the number of nuclear weapons. And those talks went on for years, I think maybe even 12 years before they came to an agreement. What are the opportunities? Well, I think I, I've made it pretty clear that it's really important stuff. And so the opportunities to create a better world with diplomacy are really right at your fingertips. Um, whether it's the ending, ending conflict or saving lives or increasing the prosperity of people, it's a great career field to get into if you wanna have a positive impact on the world. For those of you that are interested in pursuing this work, studies in, in international relations or the law, history, economics, negotiation, uh, communications, good, good writing and good speaking skills, provide a good basis of experience. And volunteering in your communities and lead, lending a hand to those people in need is good a practical way to learn how to relate to many different kinds of people and to engage in real world problem solving. So finally, just to close, I'll turn back once more to our friend Nelson Mandela, who said, it always seems, it always seems impossible until it's done. Even though there are many great challenges in the world, they're all problems that can be improved by diplomacy and working together for the common good. And you're the very people that can take on these challenges and make the world a better place. Nothing is impossible. And I have full confidence, particularly from listening in to you for a little bit, that you're all capable of making everything a better world to live in. So thanks very much for your attention. And I'm happy to take some questions. Uh -huh. My goodness, <clears throat> Consul General, thank you. You have given us an extraordinary range of things to think about, um, you know, regarding leadership and then particularly in the field of diplomacy. I love all your Nelson Mandela quotes. Thank you. And particularly this, the idea that Mandela shared with us, you know, about making peace with your enemy so then you can work together. That is a, a hugely different, we talked about mindsets before, that is changing a mindset on a world scale. Um, we do have some questions for you. And um, I have a couple of people, Manat and Surat, are you able to join us and ask your questions? Um, and please, if other people have questions now, can you put your virtual hands up? Yep, so I am interested in being a diplomat. So how did you go about getting to the role you are in? And like some tips maybe. Uh, I think the, the tip I would have for you is that um, clearly education. You need to study and improve your communication skills. So both written and oral skills and learning, um, you know, international studies or international relations or history. So learning a bit about the world and how it works. Is, is a good start. So, and then there's there's lots of resources out there about where to focus your attention. From uh, from Australia, uh, you know the, the the what we call DFAT is is the place where you would you would want to sort of look and see where they have internships and other things that you can take advantage of. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Thank you so much. And Sirat. Yeah, um, so Australia and the US have put a lot of effort into Afghanistan. How do you deal with the community disappointment of what has happened? Can you repeat the last part of your question? How do you deal with the community disappointment of what has happened to Afghanistan? That's a really good question. Um, I'm not sure how much of my bio you have, but I actually served in Afghanistan um, probably 10 or 12 years ago now. I think um, dealing with the disappointment, it, it, it goes back to my what I was talking about in terms of complexity, how difficult diplomacy is. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of good that has come out of what 
has happened with what Australia contributed and the United States contributed in, in, in Afghanistan. I've seen some of that good myself. And I think that we have to keep commitment on making sure we can still try to continue to help. And I know that, frankly, both the United States and Australia are committed to that. Mm. Surat, that's a, it's an important question and thank you, Consul General, for sharing. And I'm sure we could talk about that for a very long time. Um, you know, many of us have friends here in Australia who are Afghan uh, refugees, asylum seekers, and my goodness, we are feeling for them also deeply right now. Um, we'll move to Jack. Jack, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Uh, so I just wanted to ask what sort of drew you into diplomacy and what do you find the most rewarding part of it? Thanks for that, Jack. It's a good question. Um, again, I think I sort of found my way here through basically what opportunities presented themselves to me. Um, but I think the most interesting and enjoyable thing for me is doing things like this, meeting different people, different cultures, um, experiencing that and going back to what Mandela said, building partnerships across the world to make things better. I really think diplomacy is a way to make things better. Thanks. Mm. Thank you, Jack. Um, I'm sorry, we've only, we've got time for one more quick question. So really sorry, Haley. We, we might find a chance to come back to you. But Nick, can you please unmute and ask your question? Um, I'm just wondering what it's like for you living in Australia, obviously, as being a US citizen as well, especially in the time that we're in now. How are you finding being in Australia at the moment? Thanks very much. Well, Australia is a terrific country. I will tell you, I've only been here, I think, three and a half weeks. So I don't know most of, you know, two of which I, I, I've spent, you know, looking at four walls because I was in quarantine. So I'm really looking forward to being able to get out and experience more of Australia. It's uh, so far, the team here is fantastic and uh, I can't wait to get out and see more of this great country. Uh, oh, thank, thank you, Nick, that was a good question. Um, Consul General, look, we could have you stay on forever and talk forever and you know we might find a time uh, to welcome you back you know, in another forum, another occasion. Um, look, people have extraordinary stories, don't they? And, and here we have Consul General um, with her, you know, things that we probably wouldn't have come to our minds that you actually served in Afghanistan. I mean, that, you know, that in itself is a powerful thing for us to hear. I just want to um, read, this is a loco in the chat. He said, sorry, a loco says, I'm very happy to join you from the United States. I'm leading the Congolese community who most of them were refugees from different countries in Africa. I'm glad to share with you this meeting as it is focusing on leadership and poor leadership among diverse countries is a source of problems, right? Poor leadership creates more problems for these countries, um, for country citizen cities and countries across the world. And so thank you uh, for organizing this meeting and thank you so much, Consul General, for, you know, you are now reaching out, really, this audience comes from across the world. So it's inspiring to have you with us. Thank you. We will move on. <laughs> we'll see you. Thank you very you. much. Thank you. Oh, yes, virtual hands, please. Lots of virtual hands. <laughs> we will move on and we can see Linda, um, Linda O'Brien now with us on, on your screens. So Dr. Linda O'Brien is a leader in, um, in education, a principal um, with the New South Wales Department of Education and currently a board a member of the board of the trustees and pro-chancellor of Western Sydney University. And Dr. Linda is going to talk about building social cohesion. Thank you, welcome. Thank you very much, Margaret. And thank you everybody else. It's been a fabulous morning. I really enjoyed it and some very poignant moments. I'd just like to let you know that I'm on Gadigal country today, and I'd like to acknowledge the um, elders, both past and present, the traditional owners of this land. Um, I just, first of all, like others, tell you a little bit about myself. I'm so thrilled this morning to see some familiar faces. 
on the screen from Granville Boys High School. I went to Granville Boys High School, not as a student, obviously, um, in 1996 as a casual English teacher. And I was then wrapped in a new world. It was wonderful. I went from there to Punchbowl Boys High School and then back to Granville as the principal. And I stayed there for 11 years. Um, one of the things that happened at that time and why social inclusion and social cohesion are so very important to me is um, tomorrow, the anniversary tomorrow. I was at Granville Boys High School. We had an assembly on the day of the 11th of the September 2001 and it was before the hall was built and we were all sitting outside in, on, the, on the quadrangle. And one young boy in year eight said to me, they're gonna blame us for this miss. And I thought to myself, you were right. And it was because of race and ethnicity. And as a result of that over the last 20 years, Building a sense of belonging for many of the boys at the school was extremely important. We've got 99% of the students coming from backgrounds other than English, culturally and linguistically diverse. And we've got a school curriculum that sometimes excludes them. So in what ways do we then bring them on board? The other thing that I've been doing over the last few years, and I've just stepped back, and it was partly why and how Rashidi got in touch with me, I was the um, deputy chair of the Sydney Peace Foundation. And the Sydney Peace Foundation was founded in 1998. I was on, on that organize, with that organisation for um, nine years and gives out the annual Sydney Peace Prize, the only international peace prize in Australia. And I wanted to share with you some of that uh, and some of the, the learnings that I got from there. Um, one of the things that happened as part of Peace Week, the prize winners were, came from all over the world. And um, then there was Peace Week, a big lecture at the town hall in Sydney, a big dinner, but also a visit to Cabramatta High School, another extraordinarily multicultural setting. And on the website, I downloaded some of the messages that the students have given us about what they think peace means. Peace means for many people, everybody lives in harmony, one, one student says, of humanity, of freedom from violent conflict. One student said, I can walk out in the morning and be completely fine with who I am, what I am and where I am and what I think. And sometimes that's not always the way. So our role as education, and we've just heard how important education is to everybody, is to build that strong sense of identity and strong sense of community inclusion. One of the things that we did at Granville Boys High School was student voice, ask the students what they think, and then work um, extensively with various organizations for um, to include students in um, as a voice within cultural institutions. Boys went off, for example, to the Art Gallery of New South Wales to talk about how, talk to the director of the Art Gallery about how they think the exhibition should look, what kind of knowledge should be shared in those sorts of places. They worked with the zoo, they worked with the museum and um, those wonderful teachers, I see Bessie and Margaret there, know very well some of the extraordinary contributions. One of the things I remember, Bessie, was the boys at the Australian Museum being um, taken off to see those exhibits that were taken from the Pacific Islands and stored down in the vault. And the kids were amazed that what they found in that vault was um, something they'd never seen before and that it wasn't on display in their own country, et cetera, their country of origin. So there are all sorts of opportunities to learn more and include the knowledge from other places in our curriculum. And I think that schools need to make sure that they do those sorts of things. That's extremely important. The other thing that I wanted to talk about was my role at the university. The University of Western Sydney is an anchor institution 
for the community of Western Sydney. Western Sydney um, across the board is, um, and the boys I can see uh, are locked up at the moment because they're in those LGAs that have been severely impacted by the, um, the Delta strain of the COVID um, pandemic at the present time. And we've all been in lockdown for an awfully long time, but the restrictions and limitations in that part of the world are probably greater than they are in other parts of Sydney. Um, but Western Sydney is extraordinarily culturally, socially, economically diverse. And the university is, um, I suppose, a, a, a platform to express the bounty and the wonder that is within the community. We are an anchor institution for the community. We like to shine a light into the community and we want that light to radiate from the community around the world. I wanted to share with you some of the values and the mission of the university. The university, our students will succeed. That is our mission. Our research will have impact and our community will thrive. So that's what we're planning. I mean, that's what we want to see. And our Values are boldness, fairness, integrity, and excellence. Our principles are sustainability, equity, transformation, and connection. All of those messages for you today to take forward throughout your life because they are extremely important. One of the things that I was also thinking about when I was listening to Tina was a quote from C. Wright Mills, an American sociologist, who said that we should turn our private issues, our private miseries, into public virtues. And we've been listening along the way this morning to, um, to role models who've done just that sort of thing. Susanna tells us about how to get active and be an activist and how to participate in, in, in the community as a secretary, as a treasurer, as a leader, et cetera. And then we also then hear from the, um, the Consul General about her trajectory and so forth. Similarly, I've been um, bossing boys around most of my life actually. <laughs> I started out as a young woman. Um, I grew up on the mid north coast of New South Wales in a beach, on a beach at Nambucca Head, one of the prettiest places in the world, in my opinion. And I played with my cousins. There was me and there were four boys. And um, I took them on all sorts of adventures. So I was, and the other advice I've got too about, well, maybe not so being so bossy, but, you know, being curious and, and leading people to explore all manner of things, all manner of things. And, and, and as a child, I, you know, I had all, all sorts of plans that sort of didn't quite fit my imagination when they came to actuality. But, I, um, but the boys were quite willing to come along. So um, my advice as, I was, as I've been sitting here thinking and listening is that taking that sort of action and being that sort of organizer is extremely important. But getting back to the whole notion, I mean, the whole business of the response to um, September the 11th, 2001, I read in the newspaper on the weekend an article in the spectrum section of the Sydney Morning Herald by an ex-student of mine who I taught at Punchbowl Boys High School who's become a successful um, author. He's written, his name's Michael Muhammad Ahmed and he's written a book called The Lebs and he's just written another novel which has recently been published. But one of the things he talked about in this article, and he's quite bold and strident in his critique of the school and the behaviour of others and so on and so forth, some of which I don't, it's not entirely my memory of it, but nevertheless, he, one of the things that was really important, he talked about meeting with the principal to discuss the events on that day. And he uses the example of a student whose name was Ibrahim, who held his hand high for the whole of the principal's address 
and the principal didn't respond to him. Eventually, he said, yes, what do you want? And this man, whose name was Ibrahim, talked about the tragedy in his country of origin, which was Palestine, and the fact that the flag had been lowered to remember those people who died in the Twin Towers, but we don't lower the flag for other tragedies and disasters around the world. And it was quite, um, quite, quite a moving moment for me when I read about that, because we have many people who decide to make this place their home, who have extraordinary histories, which sometimes we don't acknowledge. It may not be that we need to always um, it's, it's not always that we remember the great sadness, but there's also great history. Mm. We were talking earlier today, Victor and um, Victoria, about love of history. And those histories need to be told because they are part of who we are. Wonderful, great... Linda. That's, it, it's, it, you just so, so evoked. And um, obviously we've now got um, uh, Minister Wood joining us. So I see. Uh, Margaret, if, if I could ask you to thank- <laughs> Thank uh, you everybody. Yeah. Look, Linda, again, you know, thank you. Absolutely inspiring and wonderful to have a, a head and a voice and an emotive, um, such an emotive person in a leadership position in education, because that is exactly the breadth we need you know, in education. Um, thank you for reminding us of tomorrow, the anniversary of September 11. And thank you for reminding us to think so broadly when it comes to sort of what does that mean? Right? It's interesting, isn't it? When the US, um, our US uh, Consul General talks about, you know, working with your enemy. Now, it's not just a flippant statement, is it? I mean, that's an extraordinary powerful, uh, as I said before, change in mindset. So um, I loved your quotes from the students and I'm just going to add one more that um, a 16 year old once told me that peace is the world at the height of its power. Mm. 16 Indeed. year olds think like Indeed. this, right? Indeed, um, and we must but, listen more often to all of them. Yes, exactly. So thank you so much. Can we have lots of virtual hands for, um, for, for Linda? And we will, we are welcoming Jason Wood, thank MP. You. Thank you so much for joining us, Jason. So, um, sorry, Jason, the Honourable Jason Wood is the Assistant Minister for Customs, Community Safety and Multi Multicultural Affairs for the Australian Government. And um, we are about to hear about governance, leadership, and capacity building. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, uh, Margaret, uh, for having us on. And uh, first of all, can I thank Rashid Somali, uh, Future Voices Galwana Empowering Change and the Centre for Optimism, which is so important at the moment. And the young people here today, you're our future, for inviting me to participate in the fourth Nelson Mandela Youth Leadership Summit. It's also great to see the Honourable uh, Victor Burton, who I've um, you've had so much dealings with over the years and he's such a, a great uh, man. When it comes to, to Nelson Mandela, and uh, good to see you, Victor. Uh, I, I know for young people, you'll be reading about him in, in books and and um, and obviously YouTube and seeing video clips, but as a, as a young uh, teenager m m myself, um, many years ago, like Nelson Mandela was just this amazing person who is reported around the world on the, the news of being incarcerated for, for standing up against the apartheid regime um, in South Africa. And, this, and the Australian governments over time took their stance. It was normally through um, sport when it came to uh, rugby tours and, and, and cricket tours and, and there was big conflict at, at the time when I think one of the tours actually went ahead. So Australia actually played a very key role in that. But the, I suppose the most amazing thing I remember about Nelson uh, Mandela, and if you get to see the movie uh, Invictus, is when he came out, and it's actually got Matt Damon, one of my favourite uh, actors uh, in it, when, when he came out of um, prison, rather than being uh, bitter and twisted and 
after spending I think 25 years in 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 this small cell, he he became um, the I think it was either the the president of of South Africa, um, and um, like I said, rather than being bit and twisted, he he just worked with everyone and, and realized one of the key aspects was working with those in sport. And, and I won't spoil the movie, but see the movie, you'll see what close ties he made with the, the rugby team um, in South Africa. And we've got similar situations at the moment that um, with this awful situation in, in Afghanistan and, and um, with the Taliban banning women playing cricket, just seems absolutely uh, absurd. Here I am in my electorate and I'm giving funding for sporting clubs who who upgrade their women chains facilities and female friendly sports and over in Af Afghanistan that's going to be the complete um, opposite and just on that issue too Australia has been uh, very uh, generous in in um, in our initial intake of of um, people on visas or uh, some are actually refugees but they've had in, in that in, which I didn't actually wasn't aware of in in Afghanistan for women most of them don't actually have identification papers that they're, be, they're being banned or, or they get destroyed it's just really sad so last night I had another zoom meeting with the Afghan community and our goal as a government is to bring and support as many Afghan people back into Australia as we we possibly can and, and every day I'm living that and working with the community um, groups. And one thing can I say about young people thing, I'm going to give you a really key message here. Um, as young leaders, and that's what you are, that also brings great responsibility to you because if you're the school captain or people know you're involved in this summit, um, people will look up to you. And so when it comes to your social media, and I know some may not be the age, but getting onto Facebook, it was really interesting. Facebook, the High Court in Australia has made a decision that whoever has a social media platform, which I do on, on Facebook, and I have 60,000 followers, if someone puts comments um, attacking someone else, and sadly, every single day, there's all these negative people and blocking, deleting people all, all the time, that I'll be accountable, or could even be on social media, someone puts aggressive comments on someone else, that you'll be accountable for those uh, comments. And just in saying that, um, just remember, try to always be positive. I know sometimes it's really hard to do. Don't be the, the person who goes on someone else's social media and attacks them. I never go on anyone else's social uh, media. Be very careful of the posts you post, because quite often there's every uh, federal and state election, though Victor Purton would know this um, just as much as me. Every year we see young people, or at the time they're young people, just put silly things up on their social media, which I probably re totally regret now and can't even believe they actually said, and it gets used against them in years to come. Now, just a few things when it comes to, to uh, leadership, and one of my roles in my community, I had a lady by the name of Donna Lee Patman come to me a number of years ago, and that's kind of on the South African theme and she was telling me how young young people, the young Australians were going to South Africa, going to um, conservation parks to, to help breed uh, lions to go back into wildlife. It sounded absolutely fantastic. Like she met some of the, the young Australians who would pay like $1,500 a week, a massive amount of money and have this beautiful lion cub and they'll be patting it all night as it sleeps with them. But it actually, in fact, it wasn't owned by a conservation park, it was actually owned by the hunters. And the hunting industry was actually releasing these animals each year once they attain the age of two years of age, and they'll be um, they'll be shot. People pay lots of money, so I got involved in that. And can I say I actually took on the hunters in Australia? A number of hunters wanted to bring the, the the trophies back home, but Australia was actually the first country in the world um, taking the leadership role to ban the importation of lion hunt trophies and in, into a country. And I also followed that up with a ban on um, bringing ivory products and rhino horn. Again, they were being hunted. And if you take the incentive of bringing the product home, that's where you can make a huge difference. And again, when it came to cosmetic testing, Australia now has probably the strongest um, response to that in the world. No products can be, uh, cosmetic products in Australia can be tested on animals and no products coming into Australia can be 
tested on animals, apart from ones, sadly, which may have been tested a number of years ago. Uh, when it comes to, to young people, my background was in the, the police force. And when I was in, in town, I had a, a number of young people going down the wrong path, getting involved in, in crime all the time. So I set up a, a youth activities group. And after, and then we actually got the referrals from the courts and these guys have got the option to either go to youth detention center or go to jail, or they have to put up with me doing a, a youth um, activities group. And the first time all the young people come along and when I say these are pretty tough uh, young people, kids, um, they'll be swearing and throwing food everywhere. And uh, I let them get away with the first time. The next time I said, if, if you want to do these activities again, go-karting, seeing the movies, I said to you, um, you, you can't do that. And they decided as a group, you know what, um, we'll stay here and, and we'll do your, your um, activity group with you. Saves us getting in trouble by the police. Uh, within six months, most of people actually disappeared. And I said to the, um, the, the organisers, bring the kids from, it was actually Preston Juvenile Justice, said, what happened? Did they go to jail? We just haven't seen. They said, no, they've all got jobs. All got jobs. And all it was is putting in front of them um, boundaries, understanding to respect people, and then they went down the right path. And just a few years ago, I was contacted my own electorate by a lady, her uh, name was Jo, who actually was in that course, and she said it was a, a, a game changer for her, um, which was just so nice to say it changed a lot. So again, there's young people, you can lead others. If you do the wrong thing, you'll lose their respect. You do the right thing, you have them uh, for life. And, and just on that uh, youth activities, in my role as, um, as the assistant minister, um, normally we put funding for safer communities, funding for, for building and the infrastructure, meaning closed circuit TV cameras, um, maybe at a, a shopping centre. But in my view, it's never fixing the cause of young people doing the wrong thing the wrong thing. So the great news is I end up, um, and I had to argue and fight to get it through my, my own, own government. That's a part of a ministry you put policy ID, I, ideas forward. We end up having $35 million for um, high-risk youth early intervention. So the kids at school, you know, who are acting up really bad and you just know they're going to go down the wrong path. Sadly, most of the time they do. So uh, my role is to, to capture those uh, young people with good organisations right across the country to support those to make sure they don't go down the wrong path. Now, also to the government last month actually released the youth policy um, framework as, a, as an ongoing and extensive consultation with young people in Australia. So you might want to uh, look at that. But just finally, I, I know you guys are having a lot of Zoom meetings today. Um, again, congratulations for putting up your hand to be leaders. Uh, as I said, Again, that also is a huge responsibility. And just remember, you're, you're, the way you act, others would follow. So as leaders, always act appropriately in the circumstance. So thanks very much and congratulations and thanks for having us on board. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. There, there is a, a lot of very just down to earth advice there. And you're quite right. The young people joining us today, they literally have put their hands up, you know, to, um, to be future leaders. And, and that is what today is all about is to in, not just to inspire them, but to provide some thought in um, tools and strategies. How do you actually move forward? And they've asked some really great questions. Um, we've got a couple of questions um, for you right now. Perfect. Yeah. And so if I can invite uh, Nida, Nida Bangash. And in the meantime, if everybody else can do what we've been doing, where you raise your virtual hand and Abby's sitting there waiting. But if we can hear from uh, Nida and then we'll move forward. Thank Hello. you. Hello. How do you balance all that you up to and also being a local member? Uh, that's a very good question because I can tell you now as a member of parliament, um, people don't understand Saturday night, you kind of want with your family and Sunday night. I get messages Sunday night, Saturday night, and I have my mobile phone out there in my community. So the Afghan community in particular lately, I've been getting bombarded uh, with, with messages. So one thing, that, again, if I uh, love wildlife, as you probably gathered, mm. and this is something for the young people. It's a really tough time, all this COVID 
situation being locked down, make sure you give yourself time. Always make sure you give you, yourself time where you leave when you get old. We, you leave the phone behind. Even young, leave the phone behind. Um, go for go for a, a walk. I love in Melbourne going to Hillsville Sanctuary when uh, we can, and I get there, and you know what? I'll leave the phone behind. Apart from I have to take some uh, photos. So if you know you're getting getting stressed, just take some time out. Uh, also, too, if on social, if if a person's attacking you and saying Nita, you, you're this or or that, um, just block them and delete them. Don't, don't there's in the police force. I had a a very strong rule. You never get to win an argument with a drunk or an idiot. So don't bother arguing um, with them because it's just going to stress you out and it just keeps going back and forth, back and forth. So um, don't put up with negative people. And the other thing is too, I can tell you now, even when I was trying to be a member of parliament, there's a lot of negative people around you saying, oh, you never do that. You'll never make it. It's too difficult. Um, just put one of those people to one side and just eyes on the prize and go for it. Yeah, very, very practical advice. Um, Nida, I think you might have another question. I might uh, yeah, invite I... Abby. Sorry, I'll invite Abby and Amelia and come back to you if that's okay. okay. Thank you. Abby, away you go. I was just going to ask with your topic on Afghanistan um, and your involvement in it, what is your take on how we should help the Afghanistan community and do more as a nation? Okay, that's a very good question. So what, what the... The, um, the Prime Minister set up is um, a committee. It's been led by Paris Aristotle, who, who uh, for those who, who probably don't know, in Melbourne, he's been helping out um, victims of torture, refugees in particular, for the last 20 years. So what we did is put an expert for the resettlement um, program. And for those coming in on visas, uh, they're going to be treated as being on a humanitarian visa. What does that mean? It means if someone's coming on a humanitarian visa, we kind of expect they've got no job, they've got no support, they're going to need a lot more um, help. So they'll be getting access to Medicare, we'll be helping out with accommodation. The numbers too we'll be looking at, and initially the two and a half thousand we've, we've actually brought out. And can I say it's really stressful when you're dealing with people on the phone, like I've had so many messages this morning, they're dealing with their, ref, with their um, um, relatives, back in Afghanistan and they're, they're telling me what the Taliban are doing and, and how awful it is. And I was dealing with someone again late last night with an orphanage where the Taliban's taken over the, the orphanage now and the kids have all had to, to leave. So Australia uh, ha has a key role to play. We love our Afghanistan, our Afghan community. And, and I've got a strong one in, in my lecture. And, and at the moment, it's more about making sure they have information. It's really tough too, because we've issued so many visas but the airport is so dangerous, people actually can't go to the airport. We're just saying, just hold on, just be safe at the moment. But again, um, it's going to be like young people like you in the future becoming leaders and hopefully a few becoming a member of parliaments or getting involved in helping refugees, which will make all the difference. Thank you for that, Abby. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Abby, such a great question. Very, very, I have Afghan friends, as I mentioned earlier, and hearing all those same stories, Jason, it's... Mm. It's so upsetting. Um, we are able to write letters, you know, you, to our parliamentarians. And there are other ways too, and this is to support our Afghan community here in Australia, to help them feel safe, welcome, that they belong, all the things we've been talking about today. You know, extend that hand of friendship to Afghan people around you is would be absolutely a, just a wonderful thing to do right now. Amelia, have you got a question? First of all, thank you so much for taking the time oh, to pleasure. speak to us. Uh, as a young woman who would like to work in public service um, after university, my question is, um, how do you honestly, as a, a member of parliament, how do you find the working culture um, in your workplace? Um, I, I'm, I was in the, the police force and you find me, I'm very kind of um, follow the, the rules. My, my office manager is a, is a female. Most, in, actual fact, my, in actual fact, the chief of staff for most of the years, they have been one of my senior advisors is um, two. The, the thing is what we, like I know we saw the, the issues up in, in, in parliament and sadly 
with the most horrendous allegations. So what, what the Prime Minister's put in place is a, a few measures, and obviously I'm with the, the Liberals and I'm with the government, and at the same time as the, the Prime Minister said, it's it's not like a, a parliament issue, it's not like a political party issue, it's actually uh, an issue for all Australians. It, it, it doesn't matter whether it's the, the young guy at the, the footy club from the way he behaves uh, and he needs his mates to call him call him out. That's a, that's the change we need to make. So there's been a few things put in place. Michaela Cash, again, our Attorney General, when it comes to, to workplace reforms and put much stronger reforms, so that's now in place. Also, I think it's $67 million were, were put in place for respect programs and consent and making sure, again, I can tell you, when I was in the police force, when it came to consent issues, I, I put young people and guys in jail because they just didn't understand it's not appropriate to give someone 13 um, drinks and go out with them uh, for the night. That's You're just getting someone um, drunk. So, and, and when it comes to, again, um, helping women in, in politics, in actual fact, that lady before mentioned, Donna Lee Papanom, she's actually running for the seat of Casey, which Tony Smith, the speaker, is retiring from. And I'm trying to help her become the next member up there, just simply because I know how hard she works. And for, if anyone wants, especially in Melbourne, I've got a, a women's group going, a leadership group, trying to help get more women in, in public um, office. And, and again, just um, don't don't tolerate bad behaviour, call it out straight away. And I think that's that's what you need to, to do and go um, to a, a boss. At the, same, at the same time, for blokes on here today, if you see someone saying the wrong thing, um, be the hero and call them out. You can you, you just pull them aside and say, seriously, that was just totally inappropriate. Go and apologise. I, I tell you what, over the time, I've made so many guys go and apologise for what they've said, um, and then they realise not, not to say in front of me again. <laughs> Good on you. Good on you. You have to be tough too. And this is where the guys, you have to be prepared to, to stand up. And at the same time too, again, in the police force, I've seen um, the, the young guy, he, he hasn't got a fighting bone in his body. Um, there's an argument taking place at a nightclub. I'm not sure if you still call them nightclubs or discos between um, girls. The next minute, this poor guy gets dragged into to save the maiden and getting in a fight. And it's just nuts. So if there's going to be confrontation, my advice, everyone, the hero's the one who saves all the mates, not, not the one who gets in the fight. And it can be, like I said, as bad for guys as girls. Thank you. Uh, great, great comment. The hero's the one that calms it all down. Absolutely. The conflict resolution negotiator. Um, two very quick questions, as we're always aware of the time. So we'll come back to Nida and then we'll move to Ali. Nida, just one more question there. I'm interested in politics, if I want to be a federal MP, what should I do? Okay, well, what, what state do you live in? Victoria. Where about, uh, I won't ask where, where the suburb is, but we, I'm more than happy to talk to you off um, line. I, I'm with the, the Liberal Party, so obviously I, I reckon that's the best party. If you had someone from the Greens today, they would say they're the best party or the the Labor Party. So you can kind of work out where you, where you fit in. To be honest, I joined the Liberal Party because I didn't think they were doing a good enough job in the environment. And I thought if I get in there, I could make them change. And bizarrely, that seems like a, a really naive um, belief to have. But in actual fact, they have got in there. And I've got, we, we spoke about wildlife and those other things. So I think have a look around to, to see where, where you, you, you fit in. And you don't have to do it over overnight. I know in the Liberal Party, we have a our young lips and I'm sure the other parties do too but um, probably just have a have a look see where you 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 fit in and then just um, get in, get involved and the only point I keep making is sometimes I see young people get in to political parties and they believe the way they need to act is bring everyone else around and down them uh, can I say and I tell this to my women female uh, leadership group you want to be the grey person in the room who's not always dividing the whole room. There's no, there's, there's no win in that. If, if I go and make some, um, if someone, if I make a comment, there could be contentious issues, um, I'm gonna lose half the room every time. So obviously when you become a member of parliament, you can do that. I'm not saying don't run with your beliefs, but um, just be wary at the start of, of not making enemies. It, it just destroys so many political careers. Thank you. We'd we'll love to have you in the party. There you go. Thank you, Nida.
And Ali, lucky last question for Jason today. <clears throat> yeah, so hi, Jason. Um, I just had a question. Um, I wanted to know what your thoughts are on Julian Hill's accusations of the Prime Minister's racist approach towards the Afghan community, where he expressed that um, Afghans who had um, who had uh, like tried to sponsor family members from abroad to bring them here, it would actually take them about more than five years. Whereas if someone had tried to do that from the UK or the US, it would take about five to six months. Yeah, okay. I, I got on really well with Julian Hill. Uh, Julian loves making big attention grabbing um, uh, statements. The reality is, if, if you think about this seriously, as I said before, if you're looking at bringing someone from um, potentially from the UK or US, um, they have a US passport. They, it's very clear their, their, their background. In actual fact, when it comes to humanitarian visas, we don't take anyone from the USA. We don't take anyone from the UK. It's always places like Afghanistan, uh, et cetera. And over the last uh, four or five years, I think we've taken 5,000 people. And as, as we've already seen from the first, probably um, since the 22nd of of August, we've brought home four and a half thousand people. Now, a number of those people, I personally helped. I personally helped to get visas, in particular, uh, um, pregnant women, people without without visas. So um, you, you find that sadly, politics gets used in this this um, um, place and, and and time when it comes to bringing family members um, over here. I think the proofs in the, the pudding it the moment. So in the same time to politicians, we often say things to, to get a reaction. But in this time, I, th I think it's more we need level level heads to actually and see what's actually happening on the ground. Or, or it's like you can say things. Um, actions mean louder than words. And the actions are obviously the Australian government's obviously doing all we can to, to support the Afghan community. And like I said, I've had so many Zoom events with the Afghan community and, and, and assisting bringing people out here. Thanks, Ali. Thank you. Sorry, can't hear. Uh, Margaret, you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you, Ali. <laughs> <laughs> Blah, blah, blah. No, I was just saying, thank you, Ali. That was a very courageous question and, um, you know, and well handled by Jason. And we need courageous conversations, right, to move forward. But thank you so much for today, Jason. You down to earth approach. It's, mm. You know, it's, it's really good to hear that. Um, what I want everyone to think about is that here is Jason you know, in the political um, arena. And yes, you know, there's the government making uh, youth policy frameworks and there's the government doing this and this and putting money behind this. And we cannot just look to the government. We need to step up and do so much ourselves. And listening to Jason and his own personal passion for animal rights, that's an, you know, that's an example of what an individual can do and we can all every one of us can make such a difference in in that area alone so it, uh, what did you tell us be positive and uh, amazing quotes running through the chat now a very kind offer from Ranj Pereira um, who's who says if anyone would like to contact Jason um, uh, Ranj is your senior advisor yes senior. yes yeah. Yeah, so please, and there's and there's even a phone number there, so please feel free to contact Ranj to get in, con, uh, in contact with Jason. Thank well, you so much. Lots of pleasure. Hands, please. Okay, people. enjoy, everyone. Congratulations. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Now, deep breaths, everyone. We have our lovely next guest with us. Um, we're just going to pause. I know we're running a tiny bit behind time. We're just going to pause to gather our breath. Um, we are literally hearing from a lot of people, right, one after the other. The questions from you students have been fantastic, right, wonderful to see people engaging. Let's seriously just stop and do the deep breathing. Yeah. It actually changes everything. Right, um, I'm, I'm sure you're all aware mindfulness is part of 
our educational curriculum these days. And deep breathing, we know our breath is one of the five sacred things. You know, the breath is life-giving. It is also calming. It is centering and helps us have a clear head. It also helps us open our hearts. So to stop and breathe, right, is a really, really positive thing to do. So <clears throat> we would like to welcome Diana Ognoni, who is a lawyer and community advisor with Fortescue Future Industries, and um, which is chaired by Australian business, businessman, Dr. Andrew Forrest. And Diana is going to be sharing with us um, working with business. Now, what we'll do, Diana, we're going to hear from you and then our next guest, John Bellavance, and we'll ask for questions. If that's okay, have you got time to stay with us for a little bit? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we'll yeah. ask for questions from, from every of the audience after both of those uh, talks. But thank you very much for joining us. Welcome. Sure, no problem. Thank you. Thank you for the warm welcome, Margaret. Uh, so good morning, everyone. Um, I'm joining all of you from Perth um, in WA. I'm sure that I think most of you are in Victoria. Um, so we're about two hours behind here. And um, it's a privilege to be presenting on Noongar country. And I would like to begin my, begin my presentation by acknowledging elders past, present and emerging. Um, and as I said, Margaret, thank you all for having me today. And thank you to Rashidi for reaching out to me personally and asking me to be a part of this um, fantastic summit. And thank you to the Center of Optimism and all the other bodies and, and companies that have played a part in, um, in making this summit a success. And of course, thank you to all our um, incredible speakers and students attending. I've learned so much from all of you and yeah, I look forward to the rest of the summit this morning. So um, my name is Diana Onyonyi and I am from Kenya, but I've lived in Australia for a number of years and I work as a community advisor at Fortescue Future Industries. And I'll give you a brief background on exactly what our company does in a second. But um, so my background, um, similar to what Susanna shared, sorry, I'm in, a, I'm in a room in the office and I think the lights just automatically went off. Sorry, yep, so similar to, to what Susanna shared earlier, um, community-related uh, work has been something that's been instilled in me since I was very young from my parents. And uh, so growing up in Kenya, we had um, things like, we had the Freedom From Hunger Walk, for example, and my dad got my sister and I involved in that from a very early age where you would walk a certain distance um, to, to raise money um, to, to contribute to alleviating hunger in Kenya. And then um, we, all, we were also heavily involved in, in fundraising for the building of girls' dormitories in Kenya, because typically what can happen is um, in, in, in some areas and some communities, a lot of emphasis in, is placed on um, what the, the boys' living conditions are like and not so much the girls. So we tried as much as we could to, to raise funds for girls dormitories in schools and yeah so so since I was young um, community work has always been um, instilled in me by my parents and um, I grew up always wanting to be a lawyer um, and, and later on in life I specifically wanted to be a lawyer in the mining industry because I worked um, in a law firm in Kenya that had a, a mining department and I would see that um, there were typically a lot of foreign mining companies that would come and operate um, in Kenya and uh, you know the mining companies would get what they wanted out of the operations but typically there wasn't really much value added to communities so I always wanted to to, to get into that space and, and did that by studying law I studied law in the UK and also at the University of Western Australia and then um, ended up finding my way into Fortescue working in the communities team. So here at FFI, I support the company's vision to create thriving communities as part of our social license to operate. So just to give you a brief, brief background of the company, um, um, our parent company is FMG, which is Fortescue Metals Group. 
and um, FMG is a global leader in the iron ore industry. And um, it's chaired and, and founded by our chairman, Dr. Andrew Forrest. And so FFI, which is Fortescue Future Industries, is a wholly owned subsidiary of Fortescue Metals Group. Um, and FFI is a global green energy company, and we are committed to producing zero emission green hydrogen, uh, which is a fuel from 100% renewable sources. So the company, um, we're, we're one of the first companies in Australia trying to go green as much as possible and tackle climate change. And of course, with that comes um, operating in lots of different communities globally. And we want to ensure that we get our social license to operate by involving all the communities we work with. So communities really are at the heart of everything that Fortescue does. And uh, we really prioritize transparent and meaningful engagement with the communities um, in the areas where we, we conduct our projects. So um, while FFI is a relatively new company, it was only founded about a year ago, our parent company, um, Fortescue Metals Group, has a very rich history of working with local communities and um, the team here at FFI aims to continue this legacy. So I'll just quickly run through through three main things that Fortescue does to empower the communities that we work in. And those, uh, those three key areas include creating opportunities through training and employment. Um, secondly, we engage local businesses as much as possible. And we also identify opportunities for social investment. Okay. So uh, when it comes to training and employment, Fortescue is proud to be one of Australia's largest employers of Aboriginal people. And we directly employ um, 954 Aboriginal people, which represents 10% of our Australian workforce. And uh, we have a training and employment program that is designed to assist Aboriginal people in gaining employment and progressing their career with Fortescue. And this program is called VTEC, which is our vocational training and employment center. And VTEC has provided sustainable career pathways for Aboriginal people in Australia for over a decade. And it's built on the idea that following the completion of training, you're guaranteed a job with Fortescue. And um, so aside from just creating those opportunities for employment, uh, we also have other development pathways to allow um, Aboriginal people to continue to develop once they join the company. And one of an, an example of this is our leadership and excellence in Aboriginal people program, which um, provides employees with a 12 month training program where they get um, practical on site development at some of our sites in, in Pilbara in the Pilbara in Western Australia. Um, they also get internal mentoring from from the company. Um, they get exposure to our Fortescue board as well, and just get exposure to, to leadership education and business training. And additionally to that, Fortescue is the only uh, Pilbara-based mining company that has flights between all our mine sites and, um, and, the major com and, and major communities. And, and we do this to ensure that um, Aboriginal people remain on country with their families as much as possible while still accessing employment opportunities. And the second thing that Fortescue does to engage local communities is we engage local business. I think she froze. I think Diana has frozen, but hopefully she'll come back. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be that cold in Perth. So if you're, if you need to mute yourself, can you do that? Um, hopefully Diana will come back. Look, I can see that, you know, she, Diana's raising lots of really interesting points here about what major companies can do for positive change. So a global green energy and product company committed to producing zero emission with green hydrogen right, from 100% renewable resources. Amazing. Like that's their goal, that's their vision, and they are moving 
towards it. What does it take to do that? It takes a lot of money. It takes visionary leadership. It takes dedication, commitment, and, and teamwork, right, to support all of that. So really, really interesting. I'm hoping Diana will return. We'll see how we go. Um, so please have, you know, you can pop questions in the chat there or have some questions ready. We will move forward to welcome um, Dr. John Bellavance and who's right here with us now. Thank you, Dr. John. Um, so Dr. John Bellavance is the Vice President of UPF Australia and uh, coordination of the IAAP for Oceania. And he's gonna explain all of that to us. And Dr. John will be talking about where real education actually relies on your integrity. Really interesting topic following everything else we've been hearing. So thanks and welcome. Thank you, uh, Margaret. And uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting me to come along. I, particularly Rashidi is ambassador for peace uh, with the Universal Peace Federation. Thank you, Rashidi, I'm really grateful. Um, so do I, Margaret, do I have 15, 20 minutes? I just wanna put my timer on. Yeah, we, we, you know, in typical style, John, we are running a little bit behind time. Let me, sorry, where are we at? Um, is, is 10 to 15, is that okay? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. That's I fine. Can you. I share my screen? Yes, you may. Uh, Victor can help you uh, do that. Victor, can John become a co-host and share his screen? Uh, yeah, just just one second. <laughs> no problem. I've got the "Are you okay, little dog?" and poster at the back. Uh, I'm a teacher of information technology, so. Um, I this is yesterday was our are you okay day so that's the little dog he's keeping an eye on me so you're thinking is he watching what Dr. Bellavance is doing or he's listening he's got an ear open for me uh, it's up to you how to decide I always think he's keeping an eye on me like what are you doing John uh, yeah look I'll start now and uh, away we go thank you you're welcome all right, so I'm assuming you can see my screen. Uh, terrific. I'll just move the toolbar out of the way. Uh, look, my goal in this 10, I'll put my timer on now so I can keep to time, um, is to really talk about the role of education in fostering universal values, interdependence, and mutual prosperity. Okay, why? Look, <clears throat> These, I believe, are the three pillars of the future of our global planet. We are, in a sense, uh, a, a human family, and we live in a global village. Whether you look at Melbourne or you look at uh, every, any, even any city in Australia or across the world, you will find that people from all over the world. So we already live in a global village, and because of our I teach information technology and coding and software development. And because of our uh, global connection through the internet, uh, we truly live in a global village. So the big question is for us, how do we move forward in the global village? And the first one has to be universal values. And the reason for that is that the, whether you're a Muslim or a Christian or a Jew, or uh, you have universal spirituality or it doesn't matter what faith you have, or you're a person simply of moral values that's not associated with any particular religious views, you have to think about the fact that we need shared values. So shared values, that means we believe in justice, we believe in love, we believe in certain values that are universal to all of us, and that will carry us forward in the global village. Otherwise, we start dividing each other. So the, the other approach you can take is, well, we don't really have shared values. And, you know, I have, I believe in this and you believe in that and so on. So that kind of divisive view is not helpful in the global village and will not help us move forward as a human family. The second is interdependence. Okay, why is interdependence important? 
we talked about animals. We're talking about looking after the natural environment. Our speakers spoke very beautifully about that. Well, one of the key values is interdependence because we depend on our natural environment for our civilizations to continue. The, the environment depends on us to be good managers and to look after it. But beyond that, look at you know, what happens with COVID. I, you know, Universal Peace Federation is one of 240 uh, non-governmental organizations in the world in the world, among the millions of NGOs in the world that has general consultative status with the United Nations. Why? Well, because look, at this point, one of the key pillars of the UN is looking after the environment. Recently, the, the uh, UN chief for uh, World Health Organization said, it is shameful that which countries are hoarding vaccines and not looking after the health of other people in maybe poorer countries. So what, what value drives our behavior has to be our interdependence as a human family. The virus is not, doesn't care about borders. So we are dependent and interdependent on each other on so many, I don't have time to cover it, whether it's economic or health or well-being. We are interdependent as human beings. And that leads us to finally mutual prosperity. And that is, again, we cannot have uh, prosperity in the, you know, just in our own nations. As we progress in, a, in the global village, <clears throat> we need to promote prosperity in other nations, and that will benefit us. So essentially, those... Oh, I'm glad to interrupt. John, can I, just, I think the slide's not, I think people want to see your face and see your hands moving. So if you want to stop sharing the slide, it'll just connect with the, the young people more, please. All right. I'm, let, let me, um, would that help a little bit? No, I think if you just speak, I think it just, I'm sorry to interrupt, but it's just uh, the, the screen's just, it's better if, if, if everyone can see your face and hands. Okay. The only problem is, look, I'm going to say no. Uh, and the answer is, is because some of the key concepts are very visual, and I'd like to simply continue with that. I apologize. So I apologize for not responding to you on that one. Oh, it's fine. So, um, look. So... It, this brings me to basically what is the role of education really in the end? And I, as I said, I believe that fundamentally the role is to follow, to, to educate for those three values. Because in the end, a holistic education looks at basically three pillars, and I'll talk about that. So let me talk about this briefly and show you some of the I guess some of the key points about education. The first is, uh, it doesn't matter which educational model you approach. In the end, it's about managing ourselves. So whether you're looking at uh, mindfulness or you're looking at uh, values education or you're looking at uh, you know, emotional intelligence, in the end, our educational models rely on us in managing ourselves well. So if you're not at peace within yourself, you cannot be at peace with others in your environment and in your family. So you may become, in fact, an agent that promotes conflict as opposed to peace. So peace, we say, begins with ourselves. So that is one of the core pillars of education is how do we manage ourselves, whether you're working, it doesn't matter which industry you're working in or what you're doing, you have to become a person that manages themselves as well. And that essentially is a label often talked about is that is integrity. So the second pillar for peace building or for managing good organizations or for education is managing our relationships. And that is that we're really looking at uh, how we can manage our relationships well. And finally, the third, and that is 
how do we manage uh, our environment? So we can see the three pillars here of integrity, heart, and character. So integrity relies on moral reasoning. So if you look at what makes a good human being, uh, my PhD is in moral psychology and the use of technology. And when you really think about it, what makes us moral people is essentially our, our moral reasoning, our capacity to know what's right and to understand what's right. But it's not enough because moral psychology or life will tell you that we don't just act because of what we know is right. We act because of our emotions, our empathy for others, and mostly our love for others. So heart becomes the foundation for how we behave as individuals. Just to know something is right isn't enough. We have to feel it deeply. And that's where emotion plays an important role in us becoming people of character and of moral character and values. And the third, of course, is behavior. So the three ad elements are thinking, our emotions, and our behaviors, because we all know that good habits are formed by us behaving properly. So if I repeat a good behavior over and over again, it becomes part of who I am. So the final two, uh, the, the, the other six pillars, if you like, is really to do with learning, well-being, and service. And look, I won't talk about the foundation for good education, but in the end, learning is what, you know, we go to high school or university for, we get skills and so on. But also now we all know that as part of education, well-being is a big part. And then finally, uh, it's a big part of what schools do and universities do and workplaces do. And of course, the third component is service learning. So as part of our educational models in Australia and around the world, we see today that service is now an important component of teaching, of becoming good citizens. And finally, the last three, which I believe are critical, is that not only do we need good citizens, but we need good global citizens. And I talked about these three values here. So as I said, in the end, managing ourselves, our relationship, and our environment is based on the fact that we have love, that we have values, and we have certain abilities. So whether it's, so the, the values, why I talk about values, is because values drive culture. Here we see that, you know, if I'm a successful, self-actualized, happy person, then I have to get my values right in the first place. And then I have to put those into practice. So the, the trick, the difficulty always is, is how do you unite mind and body? That means how do you put the values that you hold dear into practice? Then the outcome, which we see below, is that you become a successful individual. So in your workplace or whatever you do in life, you have to actually put into practice what you believe is right. You have to, to, to talk the talk, but you have to walk the walk. And then in our relationship, it's the same. In the relationship between people, in order to create loving relationship, we have to actualize our values. Same thing here where we see the third pillar which is how do we manage our environment? How do we contribute to our world? It has to be based on values. So the most important part of my presentation is probably this diagram. If you look online for what represents the three dimensions, you know, we live in a three dimensional world in physics. So the three dimensions are up and down, left and right, and front and back. If you look at it, that point of view, is the family really is the school of love. This family is the school of where we learn to respect women. It's where I learned to respect my mother and my sister. It is where I learned to love uh, my mother and my sister. So there, these dynamic relationship between parents and children, siblings, husband and wife, are the foundation for our society and the foundation for education. Because in the end, where is the first school? The school of values and the school of what 
who we became, it starts from our family. So I, I remember always showing, saying to people, always show people ask me about good relationships in the family. And I say, the first step is that husband and wife have to love each other. And that is they have to serve each other as princes and princesses. They have to have that kind of heart. And then when they have their children, they have to show affection uh, between husband and wife in front of the children, because that, that is a beautiful thing for the heart and development of children. So I remember clearly that my wife and I always showed a lot of affection to each other and the children were happy. This is a, an important, just briefly an important point. So Again, sorry. it's now 13 <laughs> minutes and I'm going to stop and I'm going to conclude here. I might Thank you, John. Start. Yeah, I think we're going to have to keep moving. Time is always such a dilemma for us. <laughs> Thank would, you. Would you like to just wrap up there? Because what is there one last thing you'd like to remind us of? Yeah, the, what I was going to show is that final slide, and that is that when we think about justice, when we think about caring for others, when we think about respect, you know, in the end, it starts in the family, and then it expands. So there's a very interesting model here, and that is we talk about self-esteem, about resilience. You know, all these things begin at a certain point. So if I'm a person of care and love, then I'm going to bring that to society. I'm going to expand that in my relationship beyond my family, in my workplace, and so on and so on. So the foundation is myself. And then it expands. It becomes, if you had a look at the slide, it just becomes larger. So we can eventually become global citizens because our values expand beyond uh, what we have. But the core is what we start with. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank, thank you, John. Thank you, John. Lots of virtual clapping happening. And, and I'm so sorry about the time. We're always okay. fighting time. But um, really what you're saying, this idea of, you know, values as the foundation, and then it connects, doesn't it? It takes us into the world of the workplace, which Diana was talking about. They two are directly connected because when you can bring your values that you've formed through family, into your workplace, you suddenly have workplaces like Fortescue Future Industries, whose values are so, you know, lead them to be so determined um, to create a greener, um, a greener world for all of us. Diana, so, you know, thank you for coming back. Thank I'm you, Margaret. Sorry I dropped off there. No, not at all. I'm very, very aware of the time. I'm thinking yes. we're going to have to keep moving because we have Dr. Karina, who's joined us now, hi, and Victor. And what we might do if at the end we do have some more time um, for questions. Yes. But in the meantime, can everybody please write any questions for uh, Dr. John and for Diana? Write them into the chat and they'll be able to answer the chat while we continue. Is that okay with both of you? That would be really, yes. really wonderful. Yes, Let's sorry. keep moving. So Dr. Karina, thank you for joining us. Dr. Karina Modderman is a researcher and lecturer in social work at La Trobe University, I believe at the Shepparton campus. Yes, so that's highly, right. yeah, highly relevant. Um, and Dr. Karina is going to um, be taking us through a number of reflections, critical reflections, particularly around youth at high risk. So thank you and welcome, Dr. Karina. Thank you, and thank you for having me. And can I just say, can we just move first a little bit before we start? Because we've been listening all of the time. And also for young people, I talk for a living, but I'm still very nervous if I have to give a talk. So if I move, I get, you know. Yeah, come on, everyone. So move a little bit before we start. <laughs> so I know we're running out of time. So while you're moving. Yeah, Dr. Crane has got it absolutely right. Yeah. <laughs> oh. yeah. So, um, just want to say first, I'm a new to your and Bangaran country. I live in Glen Rowan and I pay my respect to the elders of these uh, communities. And also, I always like to say the word of the beautiful river in those landscapes, the Dungala River, it's a Murray River. Um, I do have some slides, but I know the organizers don't really like the slides, but I just want to just introduce myself and show you a few pictures. Here we go. Can you see them? 
Can somebody go like this? Yes, I can see them. You can see my family. Um, or, I go, or I can just talk. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I will. I'll talk as well. I'll talk to you. But I just want to show you all the fabulous social workers in Shepparton on that um, re uh, right side photo. And um, just a bit about myself. I'm a social worker. Uh, I, I'm from the Netherlands. So that's a bit of my funny um, accent. And I lived in Wales and I always worked in uh, child protection. And I see myself as a progressive woman. You see here in the photo as well that we're raising the rainbow flag in the Shepparton campus. It's a campus that welcomes anybody and everybody. And we're a local university and we really, we're small. And we know our students. So if anybody is inspired to study in uh, Shepparton, come to us uh, on campus because we are um, personal and connected with our students and have many interesting courses, including social work. Um, so I'm a doctor in social work since last year, and I finally uh, finished my PhD. So I've been studying for a long time in my adult life, and I feel I'm never going to study again because I'm nearly 50, but I made it to a doctor, but I've been studying most of my life. Um, and I'm asked to be talking about at-risk behavior in uh, young people. Now, I find that, you know, we talk about young offenders, at-risk. I always find it so stigmatizing. Before I go into that topic, in the chat, can you just make a few comments? What do you see as at-risk behavior? If I say young people and at-risk behavior, what do you think about? What do you see as at-risk behavior? Drugs, drugs, yes, Hailey, good one. I'm sure there are more ideas than drugs. It's a good one. Skipping school, yes, absolutely. Isolating themselves, yeah. Mental health, argument, aggression, domestic violence, reckless driving, bad choices, peer groups, fantastic. Yes, abusive community. Oh, this, you got lots of ideas. Disrespect, rebelling, bad choices, self-harm, alcohol, unprotected sex. I always say that as well. Women that got pregnant, putting yourself in unsafe uh, situations, drugs, yes. Great examples. So at-risk behavior can be a whole wide range of things. It can be drinking, it can be smoking, it can be criminal things, criminal activities, antisocial behavior, skipping school, all the things that you said already. Now, um, in Australia, we're quite harsh because you can get um, uh, a criminal, uh, you can commit a criminal offense from 10 years onwards. So we have kids in Australia that are 10, 11, 12, 13 that are already in prison, in detention, which is really way too young. And there is an, a big campaign at the moment in Australia about raising the age, because kids that young should not be uh, punished for criminal activities. So on average, we have about 5,000 uh, young people, 10 years and over, who are involved with youth justice. And many of these uh, young people are not just with youth justice, but they're also involved with other services, like you said, alcohol and drugs, mental health. And we have a bit of a problem. And today is so much about optimism and about looking to the future. And here I am talking about the problems that we have. Um, and one of those problems is that we call the care to custody pipeline. And we talk about crossover children children that come in the child protection system because they are suffering abuse, they're suffering neglect, and we try to look after them. And we don't always do a great job, but we try to look after them. But then as soon as they come out of the child protection, somehow they get in the youth justice system. They become uh, involved with criminal activities. They, um, they do things that, you know, the police knocks on the door that they might not have parents looking after them. So we really, uh, going from victims to perpetrators, and that's not really um, a great thing. And we don't we don't look well after our children who have experienced a lot of trauma early on in their lives, and who experience a lot of the things that uh, accumulate. So it's not just one thing. You know, you might have your parents that are divorcing, but you might also experience family violence, mental health, debt, loss, and grief, and it accumulates. And we're not looking well after those children and young people. But also, they're very fragmented. We have a service for this, we have a service for that, and these people don't talk with each other. So these kids that might go from pillar to post, and if we start talking together as a, as a system, as a service system, we might be much better to actually uh, link these systems, but also actually listening to young people. Because I think the key to this is listening to young people. And I think um, words like young offenders, that's not good. We, we shouldn't talk about young people as young offenders. Their kids are their young people. And we should um, 
we really should seek with them to solutions and answers to uh, what can be done. Now, I don't think we have time anymore to go in breakout rooms. Is that correct? Yeah, thanks, Karina. Yes, we're pushing for time. <laughs> <laughs> You're pushing for time. So I just wanna, just wanna, so I've got two more slides. I'm not showing the slides that I'm talking. Um, what is really important for this, to do this better? I think early prevention. So we need to talk about kids and young people way earlier than when things go wrong. We have to go back to the start and make sure that we have services that actually connect community and kids together. We um, have to do much better in our child protection systems and reduce the time that kids are involved. Kids should be involved with sports, kids should be involved with school, not with all these service systems. So I think, for example, as some of you will know in Shepparton, we have great um, services like Haven, where young people can come together. And we know that for young people and for kids, sometimes it just takes a teacher every day that says to you when you come to school, um, how are you? Are you okay? You know, yesterday was, are you okay? Day? But this one connection with an adult can be really important. We also need services for kids that are culture appropriate. So for Aboriginal kids, we might need something else than for um, other children. So we need to be really, that connection with culture is really important. So we need to build services that connect the children to families and young people and get them less involved with formal systems. Now there's a really good study uh, done by um, the Koori um, Youth Council and they were really engaging with young people who were criminal, uh, Aboriginal or were criminal, who, who did criminal offenses. And what they were telling us in that study is we need, get, we need to give young people services that work. We need to have them safe and strong in their cultures, in their communities. That's really important. But also when we design our services, we need to listen to the kids and they have to tell us how we have to do the things. And then as we do that, we can create just and equitable systems. But it's a wicked problem and nobody has found the solutions. But I do think with young people coming through like yourself here today, and I see that at uni as well, the students that I work with, they have got such good ideas. And then I think, why? I'm a doctor. Why have I not thought about that? So I do have hope. And things are in Shepparton. You can see now it's a really strong community and a lot of strong young leaders coming through. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank and so sorry for kind of pushing you but boy you're you're feeding us a lot in a very very short space of time That's and very quick um, yeah no good on you Dr Karina look we'd love to invite you back you know another on another occasion and um and have you speak for longer because of course you're talking about something so important it's this we, we call it I use a methodology called positive reality you are looking at the reality of the situation right we can't ignore that but no. then you are bringing the positivity, the hope and moving it to action. And you're addressing these very real problems of fractured systems, Not right? Really. And, and then really this connects very much to what Dr. John was talking about. You know, providing these values is early um, prevention, isn't it? But yeah. somebody's asked a really interesting question in the chat. Now, I don't know, Dr. John, you might like to try and answer it in the chat. And I think it was uh, Tom, Tom N. And it, he was asking, well, what do we do when children don't have such supportive homes? You know, how, what do they do then as they move through the systems that Dr. Karina is describing so these are very complicated questions there's questions in the chat for you too diana and lots of really lovely comments about your um your talks we always need more time and on that note victor i think i'm throwing to you is that right thanks margaret and yeah. team as we promised you we want to end with two questions for you what makes you optimistic and what have you as a young person and to all the adults, Apollo is the only man in the room older than me, what have we learned um, about our leadership during COVID? So I've got my two friends, Noreen and Jenny, who are going to join me. We're going to go for about five minutes. It's going to be the fastest workshop we have ever done on optimism. We're going to do six minutes of breakout for you guys to share with each other. And then it's going to be gallery screen for you guys to talk about what makes you optimistic 
And how is your leadership going to lead the country beyond COVID? And for the people who are in Shepparton, you're under lockdown. The people in Melbourne are in lockdown. The people in Sydney are in lockdown. You are going to be the first leaders this century to lead us out of lockdown. So what is optimism? I'll throw to Noreen in a moment. But the first thing I want you guys to do is graffiti. Those of you who use red lipstick, uh, you'll use red lipstick to do this. Um, if you can't borrow from your mum or your sister or whatever, or use a texter. So on your mirror, whether you're at school, Diana at, at uh, Fortescue, you are gonna write on the mirror, my leader, uh, the leader looks like the person in my mirror. The leader looks like the person in my mirror. So I'm gonna go on gallery view and I'd like everyone in the room, unmute, put your video on and I want you to pick someone you like, a boy, a girl, a man, a woman. And I want you to do what the Indians do. They look into your eyes and then look at your soul. And I want you to say to the person, so Nick, Sad, everyone unmute. You're going to look into someone's eyes and say, the leader looks like the person in your mirror. Ready? One, two, three. The leader, the leader looks like, like, like the person in my mirror. mirror. Now, the other thing we can do is energize. So if you can all start stamping your feet with your Come microphones on. on. All right, so a lot of movement. I want you to shout out, my optimism wears heavy boots and you can hear it coming. Ready? My optimism, my optimism wears heavy, heavy boots and so you, so you can, can hear, hear it coming. coming. I'm a leader for the 2020s. I'm the leader for the 2020s. So now, Noreen, can you tell us what optimism is? Oh gosh, I'm so energized. Speed optimism, I love it. Um, okay, well, the, our definition of optimism that we like to use um, dates back to the 14th century. So to an English mystic called Mother Julian of Norwich. And she lived through the back, Black Death and all kinds of terrible times, survived and was an eternal optimist. Um, she had a phrase and a saying, all shall be well, all shall be well, all manner of thing shall be well. And our modern definition of that is at its Who's core. Yeah, hey, look at this sheep. Hello, sheep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the definition. That's not the definition. So our modern definition is at its core, optimism is a belief that good things will happen and that things will work out in the end. And if they haven't, it's not the end. So people are natural optimists, learned optimists. I am a learned optimist, so I've had to learn to be more optimistic. Victor, as you can imagine, is a total natural optimist. And Jenny, when you meet her next, is a natural optimist. But optimism can be learned. So I'm going to pass back to Victor now to ask, why should we be optimistic, Victor? And what is the science behind optimism, please? Okay, guys, so when you want to convince someone to be more optimistic, it's good to have a bit of science. So the first bit of science I want to share with you comes from Harvard, the American military, Boston University, the American Heart Association, and Monash Medical School. Who, when you think about living a long life to the age of 85 with good mental and physical health, what's the thing you think it'll be? Well, the American military thought it was going to be wealth. They thought it was going to be income. They thought it was going to be geography. They thought it was going to be genetics. But it's not hard to guess if I'm quoted. And what do you think it is? Optimism. Optimism, right? The key to living a healthy life with purpose is optimism. The second bit of science I want to share with you is from Michigan University. And it's about having an optimistic partner. So if you're married to an optimistic partner, husband, wife, whatever partner you've got, um, you will get the same benefits as being an optimist yourself. So for those of you who are married and you're married to an optimist, muzzle tough, you've hit the jackpot, right? You're gonna live a long and happy life. For those of you who are married or partnered with a pessimist, there might be two conclusions at the end of this session. And for those of you who are single, right? The first date you go on with the next boy, girl, you're gonna ask them, what makes you optimistic? 
And if they can't give you a good answer, the first date is the last date. And the rest of the science says, if you want to be a leader in the 2020s, you have to be an infectious optimism. So it's not the big bloke or woman, you know, like me standing at the podium that makes you optimistic. It's not. Optimism comes from the heart and it's asking other people what makes you optimistic. Jenny Boimel, you have the shortest time in history to share three or four habits of the optimist that people can take back before we go to those wonderful breakout rooms. Thanks, Victor. Um, so the exciting thing is, as Noreen said, that opt optimism can be learned. So what are the habits that we can embed in our daily lives and choose to feel more optimistic? Because we know, as the Dalai Lama said, choose optimism, it feels better. So just from a very basic perspective, it feels better. So what are the things you can do? Some of these things come more naturally to some people than others. So feel free to choose the habits that resonate with you. But a simple one is to smile. So as you're walking down the street, even with your mask on, people can still see a smile in their eyes, in your eyes. So smile, smile like an optimist. Smile at yourself in the mirror, smile at others, smile at everyone you see. The next one is laugh. Choo find opportunities to laugh. Find comedians that you like, hang around with friends who make you laugh, tell silly jokes, dad jokes, laugh. Now, the cool thing is with smiling and laughing is your body doesn't know whether you're faking or whether you're doing it for real. So just laugh, to give yourself permission to laugh. Surround yourself with optimists. Surrounding yourself with optimists is really, really important because we know the impact of the people around you have on you. So choose who you're surrounding yourself with, especially during this time. So even if you're chatting to a friend, choose to surround yourself with some people who are going to put give you that positive vibe coming at you. The last one, which is the most important one, I think, is the language of optimism. So as you're going around talking to people, and you've all had this experience, you know, you go to the 7-Eleven to buy your Slurpee or you're going to the supermarket to get whatever you're getting and the person says, hi, how are you? And then you say back, not bad. And it's just this empty conversation. So what you want to do is change that around. It makes you feel good when someone else feels good and it also makes them feel good. And then it has that whole ripple effect. So change the question. So rather than saying, hi, how are you? Say, what's been the best thing that's happened in your day? And it makes people go towards thinking about something positive. You know, someone said earlier yesterday was, are you okay day? And the thing is, these questions make an impact. So asking, what's the best thing that's happened to you? Or what's been the highlight of your week? Or what makes you optimistic? So what we're actually going to do is go into breakouts now, Victor. Is that correct? Five, five minutes. Five minute breakouts. And you're going to ask each other, what, what makes you optimistic? And what are the things that you've learned during COVID? What are the great learnings to come out of it? Uh, Adash, what makes you optimistic? Uh, just hoping all found ends. And what's ahead? Fantastic. What's going to happen all after? Forward thinking. Absolutely. Charlotte, what makes you optimistic? Um, being inspired by other people in my community. Yeah. Well, you're obviously inspiring yourself. If you're inspired by others, you tend to be inspiring, don't you? Um, I think seeing something inspiring certainly inspires that in yourself, I think. Yeah. We've had some good people today. I'm, I'm completely uplifted, Charlotte. Amelia, what makes you optimistic? I think my community makes me optimistic, uh, watching the passion that different members and corners of, you know, um, my school community, my, my town and my, my global community. Um, everyone's passionate about something different. Um, everything, you know, uh, different things give people reasons to wake up in the morning. And I just really love seeing that and finding those things for myself as well. Now I'm going to throw back. Can I thank my friends, um, Noreen and Jenny are in global demand for speaking on optimism. So they've joined us. Um, they've spoken in Ireland today, um, in Malta yesterday. So can you just give a little wave and a shout out to Noreen and, and Jenny who joined us and back to you, Margaret, to talk. 
I can see lots of hands up. If you can lead them through, what makes them optimistic and what have they learned about their leadership? Oh, and I'm you. staying on gallery view so I can see everyone. Sure, sure. Thank, thanks, Victor. Um, look, it is, it is a wonderful, positive way to end. And we were just saying in the breakout group, the media often <clears throat> plies us with too much negativity. There's so much good stuff happening out there. So Ali, let's hear from you. So the thing that keeps me um, optimistic is that I have a belief that um, at the end of everything, there, like there's hope at the end of every trouble, there is hope. So like with hardness comes ease. So let's say, for example, like lockdown, most of us would be like in lockdown, but I still do believe that sooner or later we will come out of it. So this is the thing that keeps me going. Fantastic. Thank you, Ali. That's a very positive mindset. And we'll, we'll move quickly through a number of people. Ella, away you go. Thanks. <clears throat> Something that I see as optimistic for me is I see a brighter future for me and through all the um, opportunities that I've made from people from leaders that have allowed us to do and give us these amazing opportunities of going to school and I can just see a brighter future. Yeah, a brighter future and, and yeah, and opportunities. Wonderful, wonderful. Over to Abby. Thank you. Um, the thing that makes me optimistic is seeing what our generation can do for the future with all the opportunities that we've been given, like this youth summit, how we will use that for our future. Okay, and you said something really, really important, Abby, and it is take the learning back with you, right? Really apply it, and that's when it becomes super useful. Thank you, Abby. Over to Sav. Uh, what makes me optimistic is striving to help other people, not just myself, because what I want to do in my life is actually be a neurosurgeon or a psychologist. So striving to help people is what I want to do in my life. Good on you and good luck with that dream. And I think you heard Victor say earlier, optimism with purpose, right? Optimism with purpose. And that's what you have literally just said. And thanks for your contributions earlier, Sam. And Victoria, to you. <clears throat> I just think with the people that I'm around with, like my mentors and like my relatives, I think they just keep me going. Sometimes if I feel like a bit down, I think it's just great to have someone by your side. Yeah, that's a beautiful thought. Now, I like the way <clears throat> Victoria's mentioned the word mentors. If you don't have a mentor in your life, but you know someone who inspires you, literally ask them to mentor you, right? You, you have the courage to step up and ask them. Such a wonderful thing. Nicholas, thanks. Uh, something that makes me optimistic is uh, nothing in life is locked in and everyone has equal opportunities to do what they want to do. Beautiful, beautiful. And even though we're in lockdown, <clears throat> we are not locked in. Look at us now, right? Literally look at what we're doing right now in lockdown. Good on you. And Hayley? I'm optimistic for the future because whilst things like right now, they're not like the greatest and it's hard to be optimistic about them, but eventually this will be over. We'll all be off in like the real world and able to do whatever we want, really. Thank you, Hayley. That's, that is super positive in such tough times to have an attitude like that. Let's hear from Diana. <clears throat> Yeah, I think um, I just mentioned it in our group discussion that I'm optimistic about people and I'm optimistic about, um, you know, this generation that's coming after us. I feel like generations just keep becoming better and better and everyone's, you know, um, each generation is becoming more kind and, and more compassionate and even tying it back to Fortescue with all the um, renewable energy projects we want to do across the world, we have to... Um, people live in those areas, communities live there, and we have to approach them with kindness and compassion and explain what we're trying to do and, and work with them. So yeah, so people make me optimistic in the fact that we're becoming more kind and, and compassionate with each other. And we'll move to Nick. Um, I think this summit enforced a lot of optimism that like our future's in pretty good hands. Like it was good to hear the different perspectives from everyone and because we all come from different places, there was lots of different optimism about different things. But I think it's pretty clear that the, our future's in good hands. Oh, good on you. Our future's in good hands. And you're right, such diverse community being represented here today, right? An optimistic approach from all across those, 
that diversity. Good on you. Tahira. Um, what makes me optimistic is my friends and family and the community of people that I surround myself with that are all so positive and optimistic and, you know, have a good eye for the future. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Ella, away you go. What makes me optimistic? I think it from trying my best and being around everyone inspires me a lot and they um and I learn so much from everyone like my brother and my dad and mum and my teachers oh that's so cool that you just described exactly what doc excuse me what Dr John was talking about you know finding inspiration from your brother what a beautiful thought and your parents good on you Jack you've got the last say on what makes you optimistic uh, yeah what makes me optimistic is just seeing the light at the end of the tunnel knowing that there's always a way out of this and also seeing today how many people are working towards a better future for everyone yeah isn't that it's wonderful isn't it it's truly truly wonderful to see so many people working towards a better future and it's coming from all of us so thank you jack for that beautiful final comment so, Dr. Kenny, we are going to throw to you to... Uh, I hope I've got the right Kenny. Kenny, is that your screen? Kenny... Yes, that's my screen, but I'm not oh, coming We can't off. see I mean, you. I can you see my take, background, but my... Can you take off the background so, so we can see your face? So, Kenny is one of the board members um, on in Future Voices, and it was future, it's Future Voices and the Galawa um, organisation who have brought the Youth Summit to you today. So, Dr. Kenny, if yes, if we could see you, that would be lovely. Um, you're at the bowls there. <laughs> but please, yes, if you could wrap up for us today. Well, I'm trying to bring my picture on, but it's just the virtual background that is showing, and I'm not really sure how I can. I was my picture was showing before, but I really don't know what happened. But because of time, I can just go on and sure. while I work with that. Please. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. Uh, for this past three hours, listening to all our highly esteemed and distinguished uh, speakers, um, starting with uh, Susanna Sheed, who is an independent uh, MP. Uh, she spoke about education being a very big issue for her. And she also highlighted the things she's done, you know, with development of the Greater Shepparton Colleges and the hospital redevelopment. That was really great. And one thing that she said that really struck me was that you can make a difference. And making a difference is something practical. You don't just talk the talk, but you also walk the walk and that individually and collectively we can change the world. That was a really beautiful presentation from her. And Tina, uh, it was great listening to your um, professional and life experience on how to uh, empower and support people with disability. That was really very touching. And uh, the Consul General, uh, I think Kathleen is her name. Uh, she gave us a background. Transformed. Watch my boyfriend to transform this job. Hello. Yeah. The Consul General gave us a background in IT and how she eventually found herself in, um, uh, as a diplomat. And that uh, a diplomat helps to build relationships and working through different issues. Uh, she did raise the issue of terrorism and that that work is challenging. For example, the issue of climate change, the issue of um, um, stopping nuclear proliferation, and how it's very difficult to uh, bring different people to uh, uh, achieve a common ground. And that was uh, really beautiful. We really appreciate and thank her for taking time out of a very busy schedule as the Consul General to uh, talk to this gathering. Uh, Linda, who is an uh, educator, uh, they tell us about the work she's doing uh, in uh, Sydney. And it's great to see that um, one of our priorities is to see our students succeed. And one of them is actually an author now and um, building social cohesion. That was great. Uh, we're glad to listen to Jason. Um, oh, one key point that Jason made that resonated with me was that don't put up with negative people. That was very practical advice. and. 
another thing that I also would like to mention, a question that was put across to Jason, and of course, I think to Susanna was that we have a number of young people today who are quite keen on the pathway to becoming an MP uh, to serve the community. And we've heard from someone who is a member of the Liberal Party, that's Jason Wood, and Susanna, who is an independent. So you could join a political party or you could stand on your own as an independent. So those are two different pathways and yeah. And Diana, uh, I read your background and I think I, I am from a similar background with you because I'm also African. You are from the East Coast and I'm from the West Coast of the African continent. Um, you highlighted the work you are doing with uh, uh, the Fortescue group and that was really great. Uh, in Africa or Nigeria, specifically where I came from, we have oil companies who work in communities and um, they explore for oil. They, the, if you know what crude oil is, crude oil, the oil refined product, you know, is dark and it really messes up the fields. And a lot of farmers get displaced and they get nothing. And I think that was the experience we shared about the mining companies coming to Kenya who will explore or do their mining work and the community has nothing to do for it. And you are in the forefront of pushing for how the companies who are working in any locality can give back to the community and also uh, show what we call uh, 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 you know, a, a, a social responsibility to developing the community and also to do their work, whether they're exploring for oil or they're mining in a way that is environmental uh, friendly. And it's also very touching that your company or your organization has a heart for the aboriginals, you know, in terms of uh, making employment available to them and also making sure that they're able to connect with their community by providing uh, maybe charter flights from the mines to the community so that they're not uh, too far away from uh, their, 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 their immediate family. Dr. John Bellivance, who would describe himself as the teacher of uh, technology, he yeah, told us about the role of education. And one thing that he said that really resonated with me because I was taking notes all along was that the family is the school of love and that the role of education uh, as we live in a three-dimensional world helps to foster universal values, interdependence, and the mutual prosperity. That is a very important point that you made. And for Dr. Corinna, thanks for being a part of this uh, uh, meeting. Even though you said you are someone who talks for a living, but our moderator, Margaret, was really pushy on you. Uh, Margaret, I'm not saying that to be rude to you. I know you have to manage time and manage the people. Uh, but again, you gave her time to wrap up and that was beautiful. Again, I would like to thank everyone, both speakers and uh, moderators, IT people, students, people who ask very interesting and very stimulating questions. We are really, really grateful to you. And to the visioner or the CEO of um, the Mandela of um, uh, the, the Mandela Group, uh, uh, yeah, the Future Voices Stroke Mandela Group, um, uh, Rashidi is a powerhouse. I must really commend him, his efforts at uh, getting people together and uh, going behind the scenes. Uh, it does a lot of work behind the scenes. So um, that was great. We're grateful to you. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you so much for that summary of everything we've um, looked at today. Victor, do you want to bring me back on there if you can? And before we go, <clears throat> I wonder if, Victor, can you, there you go. And I'm, Victor, I wonder if you can bring, uh, <clears throat> Kenny just mentioned, the person who is absolutely instrumental in bringing this together. Can you spotlight, there you go. <laughs> this is Rashidi. And so I wonder if we can all unmute now and just give a massive round of applause. Huge thanks to Future Voices. Huge thanks to, our, thanks to all our speakers and to all of you who came today. Um, phenomenal. I love the 
The comments in the chat are inspiring in themselves and all the thank yous that are running through. So have a wonderful rest of the day. It's Friday. We're all very happy about that. And please take the learning with you into your families, your communities, your schools, your workplaces, all the very best and stay optimistic. 